century. And his true story is a sprawling epic of courage and determination that shaped nations and changed history forever. By God, I'm Ike Eisenhower, the toughest damn Kansas farmer you ever tried to throw a horse manure on. Tonight, meet the man everyone called Ike. Eisenhower? You sure he's on our side? What I see here is any indication. All you look ready for is tea time. Either measure up or be shipped back to the U.S. Godspeed and good luck. Dwight David Eisenhower had a dream. A simple dream of freedom for all men. A dream that brought him to the head of the greatest army ever assembled. An army he intended to bring to Hitler's doorstep. My orders are simple. Enter the continent across the channel. Aim at the heart of Germany, not her rear end. There are no longer unlimited British lives to throw against them. Aside from Marty wanting your job, Churchill still bent on postponing the invasion. Wouldn't it be wonderful if all we had to fight were the Germans? Give us the landing craft. No. You're going to do it with what you've got. Robert Duvall is General Dwight Eisenhower. You are Ike. Eisenhower, even though you don't seem to know what that means yet. Lee Remick is Kay Summersby. Are you going to let some Washington, D.C. gossip drive you away? Ike's wartime driver and secretary. Our objective is the beaches of Normandy here. This is lunacy. Your 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions will suffer 70% losses before they even hit the ground. We can't be stopped. He was a soldier who hated war, a simple farm boy turned statesman, general, president of his country. Supposed to fail. Any opinions? Marty? I would say go. What if the weather changes? Mallory? We stand to lose half a million lives and possibly the war. What if the wind blows our paratroops into a defense division? Brad? I think it's highly questionable. What if, what if a dozen things happen? He was Ike. OK. We'll go. Best part about my job is I get to shake hands with a lot of brave men. Yeah, both of us so terribly alone, General. I make the command decisions around here. My God, there could be a half a million of our boys dead on the beaches of France. Well, it's on. No one can stop it now. The time to get off our tails has arrived. Okay? I am ten times the leader that that little British tin soldier is. Your plan is too risky. It must be called off now. There isn't room enough for both of us in this command. For once, you may be right. Give them hell across the English Channel. If it takes killing to stop this, yes, I believe in killing. Tomorrow, John Eisenhower graduates from West Point, the second lieutenant. I hope tomorrow he's still proud of his old man.
experiment this morning. We're going to almost crazy for it. also was made on all naval and military activities on the principal island of Oahu. It's about time on the play. They'll spot the ball at the Dodgers, 40 yard line. Second down five for the Giants. Get strong now, 10 carries, 44 yards in the game. Hello. Yes. What? Yes, sir. Any word on casualties? Yes, sir. No. Yes, sir. Right away, sir. Bye, Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. With confidence in our armed forces, with the unbounding determination of our people, we will gain the inevitable triumph, so help us God. Everything's in an uproar around here. Nobody knows what's going to happen next. And they say the Japanese submarine shell Los Angeles last night. I don't believe it. Well, they do in California. There's absolute panic. Well, what do you mean by panic? They canceled the Rose Bowl game. Well, that's panic. Everybody in Washington's paranoid, too. You were the first friend I called for help. Well, Beetle, if you were really my friend, you wouldn't have called me here at all. I spent most of World War I right here in an office in this building, and I would like to spend the rest of this war up front. Not a chance, Ike. If the old man likes you, you're stuck behind a great big desk for the duration. Well, suppose I get him to hate me. Well, then he'll stick you behind a smaller desk. What do you have to do to get a combat command in this army? Who do I have to butter up? I don't know, but not him. I don't know, your enthusiasm for combat is highly commendable. But tell me this, have you ever commanded a division in actual combat? No, sir. A battalion? No, sir. A company? No, sir. A platoon? No, sir. In your entire career in World War I, did you ever hear a shot fired in anger? How could I, sir, when I never left this building? Well, Eisenhower, your qualifications are impeccable for remaining in it. Sir, I've been recommended for division command. I make the command decisions around here. According to General MacArthur, you have one of the best minds in the Army for logistics and organization. I want you in the War Plans Division, where you'll be useful to me. Not up in the front line, stopping a bullet. Good afternoon. Sir, does that mean I'll be stuck behind a desk for the rest of this war, too? If I say so, General. Good afternoon. Oh, one other thing, Eisenhower. Even though you may have been recommended for division command, you're going to stay right here at your present rank. And that's that. Don't expect promotion. General Marshall, I don't give a damn about promotion. I came from the field of this office to do my duty for my country. And I expect to do so as long as you want me here. And to hell with rank! Sir? Come on, Charlie. Old man wants to see us right away, Ike. Another meeting. Oh, oh not again. It's after midnight. It's too late to think. Not if you got four stars. Let's see some more of that Japanese film intelligence came up with. I didn't spend four years at West Point to sit in an office and watch the old man's newsreels. Now, Ike, for crying out loud, try not to give him any arguments this time. You know, he's getting a little annoyed with you. Remember, you're in the Army. I know it. You keep your mouth shut, your brain in a sling, and your powder dry. Ours not to reason why.
forces stormed the fortress of Corregidor in the Philippines and overran its last few survivors. These recently acquired Japanese films show General Jonathan Wainwright signing the first military surrender in the history of the United States of America. And the death march of American prisoners captured with him on Bataan. Reports smuggled out of the Philippines say that almost 50% of the U.S. soldiers in that march did not survive the ordeal. Enough of that. Gentlemen, how can we make sure it never happens again? Obviously, by doing everything we can to strengthen the Navy, George. I would have been disappointed if you hadn't said that, Admiral. Let me show you why. Our west coast, from Seattle to San Diego, is wide open to attack and invasion. We must immediately write off the war in Europe and shift our fleet out of the Atlantic so that we can bring every ship, every weapon, every man available to the defense of our Pacific coast. Mm -hmm. This is not my considered opinion alone. I believe this is the opinion of every ranking officer in all the services. Baloney. I don't know, was that your voice I heard? Sorry, sir, just a private opinion. Would you care to make it public and give us all the benefit of your one-star wisdom? Sir, almost every officer in this room is better qualified to speak than I am, if rank is the measure. Well, now you surprise me. You told me yourself you have no regard for rank. We have these informal discussions to encourage independent thinking. If you have anything of value to contribute, it's your duty to do so now. If you put it that way, sir, I have no choice. My sword, General. I'll only use it for self-defense, sir. <laughs> May I smoke, General? I, I always think better when I smoke. If you thought properly, Eisenhower, you wouldn't smoke at all. But go ahead. If Russia is knocked out of the war, gentlemen, we all better start learning German. Now, Europe, not the Pacific, is the only front that all three allies can attack simultaneously. The Russians, the British, and us. Now, the British Isles must be turned into the greatest military base of all time so that from it, we can throw the largest amphibious force in history across the English Channel to invade the coast of France. A lot of our experienced officers say a frontal attack on the massive fortifications across the English Channel would be military suicide. I'm not advocating an attack tomorrow, sir. But one day soon, America will be mass-producing combat planes by the thousands. The Luftwaffe will be driven from the skies. Our paratroopers will be able to outflank those massive Nazi fortifications so that we can land a million men in Hitler's front yard. The planes you're talking about don't exist. Your whole idea is visionary. Yes, sir, that's his strongest point, I feel. Well, I don't know, what if I said your whole plan is idiotic? General Marshall, war is idiotic. How soon could you leave for London? Sir? The President and I have been talking about a plan similar to yours with the British. Are you packed? Well, General, I, I never unpack. I'm in the Army. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, are you all right? Got a proper war women's hair out of uniform. Oh, with any luck, I shall be out of this one shortly. Damn, damn. Just a minute. I'm coming. Hold it. Okay. Dick! <laughs> 
I'm AWOL. I've been waiting in the car all morning for one of your bloody American generals, and I finally told Sybil I was starving for lunch. Mm. Oh, I am starving. Okay. Mm. Again, that's what I came for. Okay, mm. I know I'm not very neat, but I do have one rule. Not in the hallway. Oh, why not? Shake up this stuffy old hotel. Connor, it's the finest hotel in London. They still have toilet paper. Oh, darling, you're wounded. Yeah, oh. but they don't give purple hearts for shaving. Still, that's as close to combat as I've come since I got here. Not true. That was a lovely little battle we had last night. Kay. Kay, I want you. I'm going to marry you. But I have a staff meeting at 1 o'clock. There you are, you little beggar. Lost track of you during the night. Kay, did you hear what I said? My dear Major Arnold. Two of my uncles and one of my dearest nieces have been killed in this bloody war already, and they weren't even in uniform. I'm not going to be cheated. All I want is to hold you in my arms a little while, and who knows if either of us will be alive tomorrow. Now we have exactly 30 minutes. Stop, stop. One of us should say I love you. I believe it's your turn. I love you, Kay. Oh, I love you, Dick. Please, I love you so. Oh, God. That'll be Sybil. I gave her your room number. What? Hmm. Hello? Oh, Sybil, you couldn't be more inconvenient. Well, not quite yet. Oh, damn. Yes, I'll be right there. What's his rank, love? A two-star? Do you realize I dragged myself out of bed at 5 a.m. and have been waiting the whole bloody morning for him to show up? How dare he have only two stars? What's his name? Oh, God, can you spell it? Eisenhower. You sure he's on our side? <laughs> yes, yes, I'll be right there. If he was a spy, he would have thought of a much better name. Oh, can you imagine? A two-star. Sybil's getting half Arnold. He's got three going on four. Mm. I always get part of the chicken, goes over the fence last. Mm -hmm. mm. Oh. To be continued. Mm. Oh, oh, oh sorry. I can't stop to pick it up this time. Put a string on it. General Eisenbauer? Nice try, uh, Eisenhower. Oh, sorry, sir. I I'm absolutely dreadful at foreign languages, especially German. I'm your driver, Case Summersby. Well, you're awful at saluting, too, Miss Summersby. I'm a civilian, sir. And a woman. Oh. I'm General Mark Clark. I hope he can pronounce Clark. Oh, yes. A fine British name. Clark. Let's go, we're Thank late. You. Yes, sir. Miss Summersby, would you mind not saluting, if that's what that is? Bloody yank. Which is, sir? Conoff Hotel. What? Good Lord. Summersby, I hate to ask, but do you know where the Conoff Hotel is? Yes, sir. This is it. For your information, General, I got out of a very warm bed at 5 a.m. to drive you and General Clark no more than 250 yards. It's going to be a tough war for you Americans. I am glad you are saving your strength, sir. Miss Summersby, like it or not, we are allies. We're gonna have to learn how to get along with each other. Now, since the British nation is our host, I suggest you start first. If you're gonna drive for us, get rid of that red nail polish. It's unmilitary. So is wasting petrol, General. Uh, begging your pardon, Miss. <clears throat> but uh, who are those two officers? I don't know who the taller one is, but the shorter one is Jesus Christ. <laughs> Gentlemen. Gentlemen. Gentlemen, may I present our guests from the War Department in Washington? General Dwight Eisenhower, General Mark Clark. At ease, gentlemen. At ease. 
You officers in this room are the vanguard of American forces in England. General Clark and I have been detailed by General Marshall to report on your state of readiness for immediate combat against the German war machine. If what I see here is any indication, all you look ready for is tea time. I've heard this operation has been called the Connaught Country Club. Well, that club is now disbanded. The Atlantic Alliance was not intended to be formed solely with members of the opposite sex. And every officer in this room will get one chance to prove he belongs here. One, that's all. Either measure up or be shipped back to the U.S. For those remaining to participate in the invasion of Europe, I wish Godspeed and good luck. Well, what do you think? You know, for the first time, I have a strange feeling there's a war on. Our impulsive American cousins must learn the virtue of patience. They will never succeed in shipping sufficient numbers of men and material to this side of the Atlantic to launch an attack across the English Channel this year or even next year. In the meantime, they must rely on the British general staff to lead their inexperienced army and navy on the long, slow road to victory. General Montgomery, shouldn't we work together instead of apart? General Eisenhower, the British Army and the Royal Navy were winning wars when America was inhabited by naked savages. <laughs> now that we've got our clothes on, maybe you ought to let us help. And so you shall. But the only attack we can launch, with any possibility of success in the near future, even with America's eager help, is one directed against the German and Italian forces occupying North Africa. Now, this is... May I ask who's smoking? I am General Montgomery. I don't permit smoking in my headquarters. You would please extinguish it at once. Is that an unreasonable request? On the contrary, General, it's the only reasonable remark you've made all morning. <laughs> the only practical offensive we can mount in the foreseeable future is against the German and Italian forces occupying North Africa. Can you get us to the airfield in 45 minutes? Yes, sir. If you can take the pounding on the back road, sir. Thank you. Well, what have you done to your fingernails, Miss Sarge B? I Americanized them according to your instructions, General. Khaki. North Africa's ridiculous. Across the Channel and straight into France. That's where we should hit them. And this year. From what I've seen, Ike, we won't have enough fighting men over here by then. What about fighting women? Wipe this conversation from your mind, Miss Summersby. It's privileged and confidential. British women do many of the jobs you Americans reserve for the GIs. We lost a lot of men already, Miss Summersby. Britain uses women because she has no choice. My dear General Eisenhower, I watched a thousand bombs fall on London one awful night before Christmas, and the Nazis weren't particular who they fell on. I saw bodies blown apart that can only have been women's bodies, picked up and placed in those canvas bags and tossed into my ambulance. If my body's on the line, General, don't tell me a woman can't fight back. No one's throwing mine into a canvas bag, thank you. I have other plans for it. You drove an ambulance, Miss Summersby. I and a few hundred other weak women during the Blitz. You've heard of the Blitz. Somewhere in that lovely English sky was the Luftwaffe, day and night. My area was Lambeth, down by the docks and tenements. The bombs would be falling like grapes, and the ACAC lit up the sky so that my little ambulance didn't need lights to see the dead and the dying. The men in my crew would bring the bodies out, usually burnt, black, twisted, the smell was so bad, we had to wear gauze masks, but they didn't help much. And then it was over, because some British lads in their foolish little planes gave up their lives for the rest of us. And where were the brave men of the United States Army then, waiting for us girls to get out of our blood-stained ambulances so they could tell us not to wear red nail varnish? What do you think made our nails red to begin with? Summersby, 
I want you to know you succeeded in making me feel like the SOB I really am. together in time for a strike across the channel this year. But the idea of a single commander over all our unified forces in England is not standard operating procedure. You know how the army feels about anything relatively new. We're still feeding 2,000 mules. Most of them wearing gold braid. And present company accepted. Of course, sir. Eventually, I believe there should be one commander over all allied forces. In the meantime, the United States should take the first step by eliminating all separate commands of our Army, Navy, and Air Service, and put them all in the command of just one man. I thought Franklin Roosevelt was Commander-in-Chief of our Armed Forces. Well, if you'll excuse me, General, what's his training for the job? Why don't you ask him? Who do you suggest as a one man to prepare our forces in England for the invasion? If you're not available, I believe there's only one other truly qualified officer in our entire armed forces, General McNarney. You are absolutely sure McNarney is the best man. Not only the best, but outside of yourself, he's the only one qualified. Eisenhower, I wish I were as certain of what I was going to have for dinner as you are about the future of mankind. Now, don't tell him how to steer his wheelchair. Joe McNarney? Never. We need him in Washington as Deputy Chief of Staff. Mr. President, I honestly believe he's the best qualified for the job. Didn't General Marshall tell you that I concur with his choice? No, sir. Well, then, I am delighted to allow my distinguished house guest to reveal this military secret. He enjoys a good surprise as much as I do. <laughs> The last time we British surprised the White House, we burned it down. <laughs> I trust you will not make us want to repeat that gesture. For, by the action your president has taken with my hearty approval, we may well be placing the future of our island in your capable hands. My hands. Major General Dwight David Eisenhower, is hereby appointed Commanding General of the European Theater and will command all U.S. forces now in or hereafter assigned to the European Theater of Operation. What's the matter, Ike? Don't you want the job? Of course I want it, Mr. President. General Eisenhower, you will be preparing men for an invasion such as has never been seen in human history. Because of the demands of war, you will have to make many decisions by yourself, affecting the lives of hundreds of thousands of men. Until this moment, I always thought mine was the loneliest job in the world.
tank's almost ready, Mamie. Is it all right to propose a toast to the new commander of the European Theater of Operations? Only six months ago, you were just a colonel in the regular army. I'm so very proud of you, Ike. This almost makes up for not getting to play in the Army-Navy game, doesn't it? Almost, yeah. I don't know whether I deserve congratulations or condolences. Why? You frightened? You're damn right. I'm scared to death, maybe. I don't know if I'm ready for it. Ike, when do you have to leave? Right away. I think they want me to go before I change my mind. You'll go. You'll go and I'll stay. You know, come to think of it, I guess I'm the best soldier in this family. Now, I've got a husband who's a commanding general and a grown son at West Point. And there's a terrible war going on. My world will never be the same again. One's will. Twenty two and a half minutes from Bushy Park. That's excellent. Thank you, General Spence. <laughs> Although I think I did nip the trousers of that bob into Fargo Square. <laughs> Sell again, Miss Summersby. Oh, uh, General, uh, I know this is being terribly forward, but um, are you liable to be long? Well, it's my first conference with General Eisenhower. My guess would be yes. Why? Sir, my fiancé is major on staff here, and um, I understand he has some time free. Would I be permitted to be unmilitary for perhaps 30 minutes? Kay, you've never complained about the hours I've worked here, the jobs I've asked you to do, so any time that your major is in town, you just let me know and I'll stop the war for you somehow. Would, uh... Oh, an hour and a half be sufficient? Oh, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Well, it certainly wouldn't be sufficient for me. Go ahead. Oh, oh. He's a lot that one, Simple. I can hardly believe he's American. Well, he's probably not full-blooded American, or he'd be like their Eisenhower. Did you know he'd made all the officers move out of the Connaught and into barracks? What? Mm. You can't do that to officers. Oh, tell that to your spit and polished general. They're calling Grosvenor Square Eisenhower Platt. But never fear. Flat 12E over the greengrocers in Shepherd Market. I, I, I couldn't think of taking your flat. No, it's not mine. This is war. The girls got together and chipped in on a lovely little foxhole. You bring your own fox. <laughs> Kay! Dick! Oh! Darling, we hate you! Oh, yes. Mm. Ah, no fraternizing with the natives. That order has just come down from the commanding general. Darling, can we get married in an hour and a half? That way, that Eisenhower ogre will have to let us fraternize as often as we want to. Well, there's one slight technicality. You see, I've just asked for combat duty. Combat? Dick, have you gone mad? Hey, you have a nice, cushy job at headquarters. Well, well, I can charge combat's the coward's way out. Oh. No, 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 listen to me. The truth is that he's made us all feel a little bit guilty. Now, Kay, you've done your share in this war. It's time for me to do it. Oh, for heaven's sake. Obviously, under the circumstances, it wouldn't be fair for me to ask you to marry me now. If there's anything I detest, it's patriotism from Americans. Now, look, we've got to talk this over in private. To 12E. Right. Now, if we're going to have a battle, I want to be free to use all my weapons. No. Yes. Miss Summersby? Yes? I'm Tax Lee. I'm one of General Eisenhower's aides. The general wants to see you. Really? Does the general know that I am British and a civilian and not subject to his orders, Captain Lee? Don't be too sure, Miss Summersby. I've got an idea before long. The British Army, the British Navy, and the RAF will be under his control. Good Lord. I may become a nun. Too late, dearie. <laughs> Put it briefly, my American driver's got me lost three times in this city. Now, whatever your faults, Miss Summersby, and you have many, you've never got me lost. So I made a trade with General Spots for your services. General Eisenhower, I do not relish being treated like a, a side of beef. There are certain of my services. Even General Spatz is not authorized to negotiate for me. And if I were, Miss Summersby, I assure you I would have negotiated them for myself. Thank you, General. At least you are a gentleman. Might I inquire exactly what it is for which the General has agreed to trade me? I'd like to have some idea of my worth. Yes. Uh, 
tell him to hold on a minute. I couldn't bribe the general with anything short of Buckingham Palace, so we decided to uh, toss a coin. <laughs> Was I heads or tails? Miss Summersby, it may seem unimportant to you, but getting me where I have to go as quickly as possible may be of some aid to your country. I would be happy to point you in the direction of the Connaught, sir, if you were certain it will benefit the British Empire. <laughs> Come along, Kay. What did you ever do to her? Miss Summersby, I've been looking all over London for you. I brought this back from the U.S. Consider it an apology. What, no Hershey bars? Arthur's court. I would suspect that's precisely the way our Prime Minister wants you to feel. Prime Minister, what sort of fellow is this Eisenhower chap? You'll find the Americans who sent us a clerk. With your approval? My insistence. It will be simpler to maneuver in out of our way. Rule Britannia. My dear, I... You have houses like this in Abilene, Kansas, General? Well, I was told there was one, Mr. Prime Minister, but my mother would never let me visit it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, come in, gentlemen, come in. Here's the conference room. Help yourself to a drink if you want it. Time to work so quickly, General. <clears throat> we don't have much time to waste, Mr. Prime Minister. <laughs> Joint Chiefs feel we must uh, launch the Channel invasion this year. My dear Eisenhower. With all due respect to America, the far-sighted country that gave the world my mother, <laughs> I urge caution. After the frightening news from North Africa, that Ronald and his Nazi Africa Corps have destroyed the British forces at Tobruk, and are once more hammering towards Cairo and the Suez Canal, it seems obvious that the invasion of Europe will have to be put off for at least a year. I thought this meeting was called to set the date. Precisely. The date I propose is next year, June 1943, or possibly 1944. Well, what about the year 2000? That has a nice uh, ring to it. I quite agree. I'm willing to wait. You are. Mr. Churchill, you made a promise to Mr. Roosevelt, you made a promise to Joseph Stalin that we would set up a second front in Europe. Are you saying England will never do it? If it means as large a sacrifice of British lives as there was in 1914. Well, you promised the Russian... General state. Eisenhower! I hear you are an expert bridge player. You must know that Uncle Joe Stalin has more aces in his hand than he wants his partners to see. I assure you, Russia will survive. But Ronald and the Africa Corps are heading for the oil fields of Arabia. If Ronald gets that oil, our aircraft, our tanks, our, our factories will clang to a halt. We must act now. If we land amphibious troops, here, on the North African coast. Just a minute, sir. Just a minute. Now, Lord Mountbatten, you're planning to land in Algeria and Morocco, and they belong to the French. They hate you worse than they hate the Nazis. Yes, when the French surrendered to the Germans, we did try to sink the French fleet. The Americans would have done the same. Maybe. But, uh, by God, we would have pulled it off. You didn't. Now, there are still French battleships at Oran, Casablanca, and Algiers. Well, you're talking about landing. Yes, and something must be done immediately to get the rest of the French fleet to come over to our side. Exactly. How? Ah. I promise you I will crawl on my hands and knees and personally kiss the rear end of every admiral in the French Navy, if that'll do it. With the French, it might work, but I doubt it. I'd say our chances of surviving the French artillery, landing in North Africa and making it stick are less than 50-50. And General Eisenhower, we must land. And we must make it safe. But how, sir? I have been in communication with your president. He has promised the tools to do the job. 
weapons, supplies, troops, and the man to do the job. Congratulations, General Eisenhower. I am recommending you to command the Allied invasion of North Africa. Sorry? Phased out of England by good old Winnie, so he can run the show. And postpone the Channel invasion maybe forever. Good heavens, why are you so awfully pessimistic? I've just been given another promotion. And that's bad? This one is, yes. My first combat command I'm being tossed in against Rommel, the Africa Corps, and the French Navy. Huckleberry Finn against Alexander the Great. So you intend to turn it down? Hell no, I've just begun to fight. That's a phrase from American history, Miss Summersby. Good Lord! Air raid! Close your shelters round the corner. Forget the shelter, get me back to headquarters. Oh, not very likely, it's much too dangerous. And don't expect me to hold the door open for you. It's every man for himself. Oh, shut up, Siri. Your next raid, I'll leave you outside. If you disobey my orders again, I'll have you skinned alive, Miss Summersby. Hey, call me Kate. Next time you leave out of my car, you may not have time for my full name. my disrespect for generals, quite honestly, you know. My father was one, for the Royal Munster Fusiliers. That's an Irish regiment, isn't it? Mm, yes, he was black Irish, as I am. Mummy always said she left him because she couldn't bear his temper or the Irish weather. Personally, I never thought the weather was so bad. Oh, for Pete's sake. Look at here. There's no direct hit. I'm very much in love, and I do so want to get married first, if it's not too much trouble for God. I'd almost forgotten people still got married. I'd almost forgotten people still fell in love. Well, who is it? One of yours? One of yours, in fact. He's actually volunteered for combat, because you've made him think he ought to. And he's so unsuited for it. I don't think he could ever knowingly kill a human being. You think I could? Yes. Yes, I think you could. Definitely, yes. My father actually enjoyed it, he told me. Of course, only if it helped the Empire. I don't think I'll enjoy it very much when the time comes. But then I'm not from a military background like you. My mother and father are, are both pacifists. My grandfather was a minister. My mother cried when I told her I was going to West Point. She never has understood. Neither do I. Okay. I have a son back home, Johnny. My wife and I lost our first child when he was only two from scarlet fever. And there wasn't a damn thing we could do about it. I have never been hit so hard by anything in my life. His name was Dwight also, and we called him Ike. Although he could barely 
pronounce it. But he died. Now, Johnny's in his second year at West Point. I guess fathers are all the same. If you're a lawyer or a doctor, then that's what you want for your son. And if you're a soldier, then that's what you want him to be. At least I did. But I can't help praying that the war will be over before he's in it. Now, if I should do anything to add one extra day to this war, or cost the life of someone like Johnny, I believe this. I may say it differently, maybe not as well, but this is what I believe. Now, if it takes killing to stop this, then yes, I believe in killing. I didn't mean to turn this into a sermon, Kay. I needed to talk to someone, and uh, you were here. Perfectly all right, General. You've made me feel like the SOD, I really am. All clear! Sorry, Governor, but I'm taking him back now. Lend leash, you know. Newly suffocated. Darling, where are they sending you? Scotland. Scotland? Oh, my God. Do you know something I don't? Darling, I know everything you don't. I'm with the commander of this whole terrible mess, remember? What's in Scotland, Kay? I can't tell, not even you. All this damned war. Not to worry. Whatever happens, I've decided to surrender. Don't do anything foolishly brave. Do you promise? I want you back in one large delicious piece. Kay, if I should happen to get through wherever we're going, let's get married, even if it's in a foxhole in Siberia. Do me one favor, darling. What? Always hide behind me. Congratulate you on finding such a lovely hideaway for the general. And so close to London. Well, he's got to have one place where he can relax. You know, ride horses, play a little golf. <laughs> Who would you boo? <laughs> what makes you think Ike wants a puppy for his birthday? This one can't even salute. Besides, I thought you didn't care for American generals. Don't pry. Well, all right. I need a favor from the general, a big one. Ah, that's better. The war is confusing enough. What do you mean? I like my women to stay in character, conniving. Very funny. Did your cloak and dagger mission to North Africa accomplish anything? Well, I found that uh, some of the French generals there are pro Vichy, some were pro de Gaulle, some were anti de Gaulle, and a few were even pro Nazi. But one thing's for sure, every last one of them is anti-British. 
The French, they are a funny race, parlez-vous. And no wonder the British were so happy to let us run the show in North Africa. Mark, what Frenchman can we get to keep the French from firing on us when we hit the beaches? The French officers all suggested General Henri Giraud. Giraud. Hero of both world wars, refused to go along with the French capitulation to Hitler and wound up in a Nazi prison. But he escaped, didn't he? That's right. Right now he's someplace in southern France. Giraud. Any man that can escape from a Nazi prison camp has the kind of guts we need. But how? If he's still in Vichy, France. But it's too late for any more butts. Find Giraud and get him out any way you can. Right. All right, let's go. It's time for my surprise party. How the hell did you know we were giving you a surprise party? I've broken your code. <laughs> okay. Hey, that's, that's good. Just put that on the middle of the table. All right? Civil! How are you? Thank you. Thank you. All right, just drop the booze on the table, OK? All right, we got everything now? We don't have much time here. Surprise. <laughs> well, there goes another military secret. <laughs> All right, one, two, three, four. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear General. Happy birthday to you. Oh, General, you ruined the party. I'm sorry, Miss Ryan, but I understand you're having your own later over the green grocers. Oh, you want everybody to spy. I want to thank you all for remembering a birthday that I would rather forget. General. This is for the cake. You might need it. <laughs> Three candles. A little late, but uh, in honor of your third star. That means I'm still outranked by uh, General Montgomery. <laughs> <laughs> well, just make a wish, sir, and blow him out. How did you know I wanted one? Oh, well, everybody needs a dog to kick around, sir. I thought he might take the pressure off the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> you may be right. You better blow out the candles, General. They're melting my icing, and we can't get any more sugar. Yeah. Take yeah. 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 Don't Go forget on, to man. make that wish. I want it, please. <laughs> <laughs> right. Good. I got, I got. <laughs> may I ask what you wish, General? That all the dying that's about to happen will be worth it. Uh, top secret and classified. I was about to write a letter to Mamie. Oh. What is it you want? I want to go to North Africa. Oh, yeah, that didn't come out the way I meant at all. I intended to plead. You could never plead, Kay. Argue, order, shout, but uh, never plead. That young man of mine, the one I told you about, Major Richard Arnold, he was shipped to Scotland last night and... Um, being here, I, I can't help but know that that means he'll be in your invasion of North Africa. Kay, you've been cleared for sensitive information. But as you know, these things mustn't be mentioned. Well, I didn't think there was any harm in telling you. Sometimes I wish your Prime Minister felt the same way. Uh, about your Major Arnold, what do you want me to do about him? Have him uh, transferred out? Because I can't, won't do that. No, 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 no. He, he did if you thought I'd done something like that. No, you see, the thing is, last night he asked me to marry him. Or I asked him, I can't remember which. He's asked me many times before, but last night was definite. We were both perfectly sober and fully clothed. Yes, that is quite definite. This isn't just some wartime roll in the hay, General. Dick and I have both been married before, and uh, my divorce has come through, and his will too, any minute. I love him, and I would dearly love to become his bride before he stumbles into a booby trap or something equally foolish. 
If I'm in North Africa, I have a chance of bringing it off. But you're a civilian, Kay. I can't order a civilian into a combat zone. I'm not very civilian, you know that. And, and you will need a driver over there. Generals never walk. <laughs> so now you know why I gave you this bloody expensive puppy, sir. Well, now, who's going to train this bloody expensive puppy? Oh, I'll teach him, General. I promise you. He's very bright. I'll explain things to him, and I'll set him a good example. I'm sure you will. You know, I think I'm going to name him, uh, Telek. T-E-L-E-K. That's for Telegraph Cottage and K. Uh, do you like it? I mean, uh, since you're training him, I guess he's half yours. Yes. Does that mean yes or no? <sighs> K, have you ever fired a pistol? Oh, yes, sir. My father insisted I learn to shoot and to ride. He was in the cavalry, and I think he felt everybody ought to be. This is a Beretta. It's small, has a little recoil. At close range, is quite effective. I want you to go out in the meadow tomorrow and fire it until you can knock the buttons off a German uniform at 20 yards. I wouldn't want anything to happen to you where you're going. Oh, General, thank you. Oh, sorry, sir. I know that was unmilitary, but I thought you'd prefer it to my salute. Well, you're absolutely right. <laughs> Major, to be careful. I wouldn't want him on my conscience. Been a long road. Je vous embrasse. Au nom de la France. This way, sir. I'll show you I'm ready to take over full command to the suite. I tried to explain, but he can't understand my French and he doesn't want to understand my English. Naturellement, the first landings must occur near Marseille. Then we must move quickly up the valley of the Rhone and split the Nazi forces in two. And then, Paris. General Joe, obviously you've been out of touch with the uh, military situation. The attack will occur at dawn tomorrow, but not in France. In French Morocco and French Algeria. Incroyable. Unbelievable. You are attacking neutral French possessions. The French Army and Navy will resist to the death. That's why we need your help here, sir. This way, General. Joe, I understand your feelings. But North Africa... We must try to stop Rommel's drive toward the Mideastern oil. And throw the Germans into the Mediterranean. Now, you must order the French Navy and coast artillery not to fire on our ships. I must refuse. It is impossible. I will take command only to return with the Liberating Army to the soil of France. For this reason, I am here. For this reason only. For God's sake, you've been rotting in the Nazi concentration camp. Now, who is the enemy? Them, not us. Now, you must issue this order. What will be my authority? Commander of all French forces in North Africa. I'll give you my guarantee. And what will be your authority? Commander-in-chief of all combined allied forces in this theater. You do not understand. My country, my family will not allow me to assume a subordinate command. I am Joffre. I am Foch. I am Giraud. I am France. Well, by God, I'm Ike Eisenhower, the toughest general. Damn Kansas farmer, you general. ever tried to throw a horseman over on? Ike. Ike. You don't have one soldier to command in this invasion except for the poor misguided idiots who are planning to shoot the wrong way. You have a whole French Navy planning to shoot the arms and legs of American kids who think all Frenchmen are like Lafayette. You have a French government in Vichy helping to ship French Jews to Nazi concentration camps. 
And don't try to tell me you're God, General Duro, because I know you're not. Charles de Gaulle is God. He told me so himself. Now you're going to tell the French army and French navy we're trying to free your country, not hurt it, or by God, I'll break you to civilian second class. Never have I been so outraged. General Henri Honoré Giraud is second in command to no one. Uh, you've just seen a lesson in Kansas diplomacy. What am I going to learn to keep my mouth shut? Hello, everybody. This is Lowell Thomas in London. At dawn this morning, a joint British and American task force launched a series of landings in French North Africa. They hoped that the French would welcome them with open arms. Ah, but they were wrong. French naval vessels and coastal batteries opened up a murderous bombardment. Allied naval vessels had no choice but to return the fire, and the battle was on. The British, to some extent, are reaping the harvest of hate sown when they tried to sink the French fleet. And the French include anyone who helps England, that means America, of course, in their passionate hatred. American troops, many of them shipped directly from basic training in the United States, clambered into landing craft under heavy fire, heading for the distant beaches. Their first time in battle, the first offensive action of American ground troops since Pearl Harbor. The French Casablanca Fortress has opened fire on our ships. They've scored a hit at 14,000 yards. Three of our paratroop planes shot down, sir. Where the hell is George Patton's task force? We've lost radio contact with his ship, sir. Heavy artillery at Algiers Harbor, General. More French batteries shooting at us. The French, they are a funny race, parley -vous. What a waste. What a terrible waste. Patton was supposed to land near Casablanca four hours ago. Where the hell is it? Oran Airport on fire, sir. Ike, Marshal Patton is broadcasting from France. He's ordering the French Army and Navy to resist us to the death. Oh, old man speaking with a German accent. Sir, General Patton radios that he's ashore in force at Casablanca and kicking the hell out of the French. Right. The frogs are throwing down their arms and coming over to our side. Yeah, it's about time. Bless his heart. We'll send him a message that uh, their weapons are to be returned. They're to be treated as allies, not frogs. Bless his heart. Get old Patton. Sir. General Giroux. It has been a terrible night for France, for me, and for you. General Henri Giraud places himself under your command. the submarine warfare in the Mediterranean. Allied troop transports from England with reinforcements for Eisenhower's forces are being attacked by a wolf pack of Nazi submarines. Losses reported to be mounting daily. This is the capital station. Abandoned ship. To your stations. Navy. Four ships have been torpedoed near Iran. One of them is the Strathallan. Strathallan? Well, that's the troop transport. Kay Summersby is aboard. Was aboard. Let me see that. 
Oh, God, okay? They're picking up survivors, but that's all we know. I could have arranged for her to come with us by air. I brought the dog. Can you tell? Oh, I've been torpedoed. At least. <laughs> Can you tell me if Major Richard Arnold is at his headquarters? He's with the engineers. Any of you guys know a Major Arnold with engineers? Well, I do. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, baby. Must have given you the wrong name when he torpedoed you. Excuse me, I'd like to face towards your headquarters now, Jess, please. Honest now, who are you gonna call, honey? General Dwight D. Eisenhower. My God, it's Queen Mary. <laughs> hey, what's all the noise? Lady wants to, uh, lady wants to talk to Eisenhower, sir. Corporal, I'm tired and cold and nasty, but I wouldn't want to ask General Eisenhower to tear your head off, so please put the call through immediately. All right, what is all this bull about Ike? Ah, uh, Colonel, I am a civilian on General Eisenhower's personal staff, sir. I'm here by his orders and assigned to his headquarters. He will want to know where I am. I'm certain he knows that Strathallan has been torpedoed and sunk, so please, I beg you to help me reach him by telephone. What kind of game are you playing? I'm not. He wouldn't import a civilian for his headquarters staff. Get out, Jeeves. See if you can reach one of his aides. Yes, sir. Uh, Colonel, um, <gasps> sir. Do you suppose I could possibly have a cup of coffee, please? I haven't had anything to eat since yesterday, and I'm absolutely famished. I'd like to accommodate you, but this isn't a coffee shop. Uh, Colonel, sir, they want to know who's calling. Tell them. Tell them it's Kay Summersby, and I'm all right. Uh, some dame named Summersby came in here claiming that she's been... What? Is she all right? Well, yeah, she's all right. She's just, uh... Look. Who? General Eisenhower would like to speak to you. Thank you. Hello, General. Get the lady a chair. Yes, I'm not hurt. Oh, a little wet, but all in one piece. Oh, we were hit about uh, 1.30 this morning. Drifted about in lifeboats all night. A destroyer picked us up. British, of course. Oh, well, I muddled through. Yes, Oran. I I'm here at headquarters looking for Dick. Major Arnold. Uh, and they tell me he's not here. Sorry? Oh, yes, sir. There's an officer here. All right. He wants to explain all that bull about Ike. Uh, Colonel Offenheim here, sir. Uh, General. Uh, sir, sir. Sir. Uh, sir. Major Richard Arnold. No, sir. Oh, 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 oh j just a moment, sir. Uh, there is a Lieutenant Colonel Arnold. Perhaps he's... Lieutenant Colonel? Yes, sir. One of you sad sacks go in the next office, get Lieutenant Colonel Arnold, bring him in here immediately. Promoted? Oh, poor Army. Yes, sir. He's uh, sending his own plane for you in the morning. Oh, isn't that lovely? Sir? Oh, yes, sir. We'll make her as comfortable as possible, sir. Yes, sir. What? Well, she can have my quarters. Okay. Dick! Yes, sir. Oh! Dick! No, sir. Oh! Oh, darling. How the hell did you get to North Africa? Oh, it's too long a story. I, I was torpedoed, and it was wet and awful, and the only thing that matters is that I'm here, and that you're here. Mm. And look, look, I brought this night dress all the way from England for our wedding night. Now that your divorce is through, I don't want to wait another minute. 
We, we, we hauled the wounded into our boat and I tore up something I hate for bandages, but I only tore it where you won't miss it. I don't fall. Darling, you know what you can do for me now? What? Get me a dreadful American hamburger, please. The Allied advance in North Africa has bogged down in the mud and rain of the worst winter in memory. And out of the storm and mist has come the echo of a name sending a chill through the bones of those who remembered the armored blitzkrieg that destroyed France. Rommel, Marshal Erwin Rommel, on the march again. Hitler's ablest general has ordered the huge Tiger tanks of his Africa Corps to make a surprise attack. Aided by German air power, his tough Nazi Panzer units have suddenly slashed into the Tunisian mountains and given green, disorganized American troops one of their worst defeats in our military history at a place none of us ever heard of before, Kazarine Pass. and American confidence. The death toll among American troops is devastating. Even worse, word from the battlefield is that the Tunisian tribes are stripping the bodies of anything that can be sold at the bazaars. It's going to be a long, a long, tough war. this sector. Let's go, Kay. Rommel isn't taking any prisoners this trip. Right now, immediately, I want a counterattack launched. Plane coming in! Sorry, Miss Sumsby. I forgot to say thank you, didn't I? You bet your stupid tail. Hoffenberg's command post. A whole company of combat engineers has been working day and night to build it. It's bomb-proof. Until now. Here we go. Damn it, Ward. Your troops control the passes, you had the artillery, and you let Rommel's pants surprise you, and now there are 1,500 American boys lying dead in the Algerian mud, being picked over like hogs in a slaughterhouse. Ike, the French wouldn't take orders from me. The British wouldn't take orders well, from me. Well, why anybody. the hell should they when you're sitting here in your mink line foxhole getting the battle phone in 70 miles from the front? Now, Ward, within 24 hours, I want you to attack Rommel with everything we've got. It'll take a lot longer than that to perfect our defenses. You didn't hear me, Ward. Attack. I said attack. Now, I'm taking full responsibility. Now, where's the best place to hit, and with what? All right. 
I'd say probably our best position. Be right about here. The Fond Duke Sabela Road. We we'll start with the 18th Armored, 16th Infantry. Have you personally seen the terrain at the Funduk Road? Have you ever looked at the 18th Armored Tanks? It's all the reports right here. Erwin Rama wrote a book once, Ward. I memorized almost every word of it because I knew I'd have to fight him someday. He said, nothing can take the place of the commander at the front. Let the men see you. The higher the rank, the greater the example of the commander on the men. In that case, Ike, maybe you should go. Okay, Ward, I will. And when I get back, you better damn well get out in there and see for yourself. And if you fall up again, I'm kicking your tail back to the U.S. and putting George Patton in command. Now, get me a jeep and a driver and tell him to get me as close to the front as he can. And, Ward, if Rommel attacks, I'll phone you. Don't let it ring more than once. I feel a lot safer. Commence firing. Front edge of this battle line. Sir? Front edge of this battle line. Four miles over that ridge, sir. On the double. Soldier, don't stop. I just want to see how these machines are doing. Well, if this was a woman, I'd kick her out of bed, sir. Why? It's a stinking coffee. It's got a pea shooter for a gun, wouldn't blow the cap off a bottle of Budweiser. The supply gave us training ammo instead of armor piercing. Why was that? That's all they had. <laughs> Crafty used his stuff goes right through the plates. And what the hell, right? I guess back home they need all the good steel for Cadillacs. The new Sherman tanks are on their way now. Four of my buddies on their way too, sir. They just brought them in, over there. Son of a bitch, Rommel. I saw we were overextended and took advantage of it. So now there are thousands of green American boys dead while their green commander in chief is still alive, sitting behind a stupid desk. You didn't have much help from your commanders in the field, Ike. Well, who picked them? I did. I'm the commander, Luke. You know that. I'm not responsible for this horrible mess.
Michael, chap. Devil is good to see you again. Marnie, my congratulations to you and your men for breaking through the Marif line. As you British say, good show. Yes, it was, wasn't it? You really got Rommel on the run. That's when he's most dangerous. As you have learned to your sorrow at Catherine. I could have predicted that. Too bad you didn't. I've relieved General Hoffenberg of his command and sent him back to the U.S. General Patton here is taking over for him. George is our leading tank expert, and the best man we have for the job. Delighted. I've heard so much about you, General. Hold it there, sir. Up until this moment, I didn't believe it. Pearl handle, don't they? Ivory. And I use them. Let's cut the bull, gentlemen, comrade. Our job is to kill Krauts, and I can't wait to get started. George, uh, you can relax. The show's over. They're out of film. Show's over, fellas. Thank you, General. Hi, cool chap. If I may suggest a course of action to capture Tunis, you Americans just hang on to your present positions and allow my 8th Army to continue to move forward. Our British desert rats are tough, experienced fighters. They'll do the work better if there's no one cluttering things up. The hell they will. Last week, my son-in-law was killed by the Germans. Neither you nor anybody else is going to stop me from killing them. Money, I assure you, with General Patton in command, American forces will win their share of battles. You told me the same thing about your famous General Hoffenberg. I got rid of Hoffenberg, and I'll get rid of anybody else who can't do this job. That's fascinating, Ike. By the way, if your inexperienced American troops are defeated again, who, may I ask, gets rid of you? The tide first started to turn at El Alamein, where the battle began with the greatest nighttime barrage in all history. The concentrated fire of a thousand mass cannons under the command of General Sir Bernard Montgomery. And the bombardment shattered Rommel's Africa Corps, sending the Germans reeling in retreat across the endless sands, right into the arms of the Allied forces under Generals Patton and Bradley. The trap was closed with the help of the three French troops under Giraud and de Gaulle. And what resulted was best summed up by that fierce old bulldog, Winston Churchill, in an address to Parliament. General Alexander, with his brilliant comrade and lieutenant, General Montgomery, has gained a glorious and decisive victory in what I think should be called the Battle of Egypt. Ah, this is not the end. Uh, it is not even the beginning of the end. Uh, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. The end of the beginning. 300,000 Axis prisoners, as many as the Russians captured at Stalingrad, now a large part of the German and Italian armies that once held this part of the world captive, they themselves are being herded into prison compounds. And now we're holding a victory parade in the liberated capital of French Tunisia, a parade to honor the combined forces under General Eisenhower, the untried American commander who underwent his baptism of fire at Kazarine Pass and turned that disaster into the greatest triumph of Allied arms since World War I. This is Lowell Thomas with the Allied forces in Tunis at last.
was a lovely parade, General. I adore those Arabian horses. It's like being in a circus. Without the candy floss, of course. Do you ride, Kay? Oh, good Lord. I told you my father was in the cavalry. Had me on a horse before my nappies were dry. We have Arabian horses here at the villa. Would you care to ride with me this afternoon? Oh, well, I'd love to, but I have no riding clothes, no proper boots, nothing. Thanks awfully, but I, I really couldn't. We'll find something for you to wear. But, General... That's an order. straight. Dick. Oh, please, no. Yes. The fighting was over. He was walking through a minefield, well marked. He hit his own tripwire. Dick, uh, Colonel Arnold was killed instantly. Sorry, such an inadequate word. I hope you understand how I feel. You killed him. Okay. You and all the other filthy gold braid generals with your bugles and parades, pinning medals on each other. Dick, poor gentle Richard wouldn't hurt a soul. But he wanted to play with a big boy, so you taught him all you knew. And you thought he was listening, but he didn't understand. He never really could understand. He did understand his duty to his country. Oh, duty and honor, don't give me that ball. It's all for power and politics. And I won't play your bloody man's game anymore. I won't, I won't. For king and country, well, to hell with a king and to hell with a country. You killed him, all of you, you killed him. Kay, get a hold of yourself. <laughs>
This motion picture is a dramatization based on fact. Events have been recreated and certain names and characters have been changed. Dwight Eisenhower often told of those early days in Abilene, Kansas. I guess we were poor, he'd say. But it is the glory of America that we never knew we were. He was the greatest American hero of the 20th century. And his true story is a sprawling epic of courage and determination that shaped nations and changed history forever. By God, I'm Ike Eisenhower, the toughest damn Kansas farmer you ever tried to throw a horse manure on. Tonight, meet the man everyone called Ike. Eisenhower? You sure he's on our side? What I see here is any indication, all you look ready for is tea time. Either measure up or be shipped back to the U.S. Godspeed and good luck. The entire terror is your wounded Dwight David Eisenhower had a dream. A simple dream of freedom for all men. A dream that brought him to the head of the greatest army ever assembled. An army he intended to bring to Hitler's doorstep. My orders are simple. Enter the continent across the channel. Aim at the heart of Germany, not her rear end. There are no longer unlimited British lives to throw against them. Aside from Marty wanting your job, Churchill still bent on postponing the invasion. Wouldn't it be wonderful if all we had to fight were the Germans? Give us the landing craft. No. You're going to do it with what you've got. Robert Duvall is General Dwight Eisenhower. You are Ike. Eisenhower, even though you don't seem to know what that means yet. Lee Remick is Kay Summersby. Are you going to let some Washington, D.C. gossip drive you away? Ike's wartime driver and secretary. Our objective is the beaches of Normandy here. This is lunacy. Your 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions will suffer 70% losses before they even hit the ground. We can't be stopped. He was a soldier who hated war, a simple farm boy turned statesman, general, president of his country. Suppose it should fail. Any opinions? Marty? I would say go. What if the weather changes? Mallory? We stand to lose half a million lives and possibly the war. What if the wind blows on paratroops into a fence position? Brad? I think it's highly questionable. What if, what if a dozen things happen? He was Ike. Okay. We'll go. Best part about my job is I get to shake hands with a lot of brave men. Yeah, both of us so terribly alone, General. I make the command decisions around here. My God, there could be a half a million of our boys dead on the beaches of France. Well, it's on. No one can stop it now. I am ten times the leader that that little British tin soldier is. Your plan is too risky. It must be called off now. There's room enough for both of us in this command. For once, you may be right. Give them hell across the English Channel. It takes killing to stop this. Yes, I believe we'll kill him. Tomorrow, John Eisenhower graduates from West Point, second lieutenant. I hope tomorrow he's still proud of his old man. They're hungry for news. They'll try to trap you into revealing what the next military move's gonna be. You better walk on eggs. Well, what's wrong with telling them? Like, these are reporters. They're not generals. The less they know, the better. You tell them this. Our glorious troops have triumphed again. And you say, now that's off the record, so it'll be sure in print. Tex, why do I have so much more respect for the integrity of newspaper men than you do? I used to be one. <laughs> To wind this up, I'll go back over the main military actions. Our glorious troops have triumphed again after they were humiliated at Kasserin Pass, one of the greatest defeats in American military history, a defeat which was largely my fault. <coughs> Cigarette. 
I've learned a valuable but costly lesson from General Rommel. The General, why did you refuse to accept the German surrender personally? The Nazi armies have violated every code of human decency. And not until the last Nazi general has signed the last surrender will I meet with one of them face to face. Uh, general Eisenhower, the British press is claiming that only General Montgomery's smashing victories in the desert saved you and the American forces from your own disastrous mistakes. Where do they get that knowledge from? Uh, from General Montgomery. <laughs> very, very interesting. He also hinted that he wouldn't be opposed to taking over command of the invasion of France, whenever that is to be. Do you have a reply? General Bernard Montgomery is one of the finest gentlemen and uh, most capable soldiers it has ever been my good fortune to meet. We are allies in the truest sense of the word. All right. Good day, gentlemen. Thank General you. Eisenhower, why do you have so little faith in the news media that you cut off any more questions after feeding us this unadulterated bull? Sit down, Tex. Combined Allied forces will assault Sicily the second week of July with the 7th Army under General Patton attacking the southern beaches here. And the British 8th Army under General Montgomery attacking the eastern beaches here south of Syracuse. But we'll lead the enemy to believe that we will be attacking the western end of the island. Now, this is a dangerous amphibious attack whose success depends upon complete surprise. Now, you gentlemen of the press are now in possession of information that could lead to the loss of thousands of Allied lives. I hope you have some idea of how I feel every night. Good afternoon. Thank you keep this up, I think I can get you the Iron Cross. Well, this isn't just a general's war, Tex. Uh, the press are as much a part of it as the rest of us, and I want them to feel that way. Well, I'll tell you what. That entire press corps will be afraid to have one drink from now on, out of fear they'll spill something to a German spy. You've struck a blow for prohibition. Did I ever remember to thank you for staying on the job with me? Yes, sir. Well, thank you, Kay. Yes, sir. What have you done to your hair? Nothing, General. Well, that's what's wrong with it. And your uniform's getting sloppy. You should try some uh, red polish on your nails. Yes, sir. Don't agree with me, Kay. It makes me uncomfortable. I'm sorry, sir. Don't be sorry. Well, the past is past, Kay. I know that a month is a short time when you've uh, lost someone you love. But an award can be like a lifetime. Now, when you're not driving, I want you to come into my office and take care of my mail. Can you type? Oh, Lord. Answer my question. Well, naturally, since I'm a female, I was born typing. <laughs> oh, that's better, Kay. You're now my secretary, and I hope you hate it. American and British airborne and amphibious forces have hit the southern and eastern shores of the island of Sicily in an overpowering assault that achieved complete surprise. Axis forces rallied after the initial landings and fought back fiercely, as they always do. But American armor, under old blood and guts Patton, threw them back from the beaches, and Patton's 7th Army rolled through town after town, much of the time in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Patton's forces have already knifed through Marsala and Palermo and are heading for the ancient port of Messina, only four miles from the toe of the Italian boot. The British, under Montgomery, have met stiffer opposition. But Patton's advance has cut the island in two and shaken the very foundations of the Italian government. The Sicilians have shown how they feel about Mussolini in no uncertain terms. Viva Italia!
Better turn your radio on, Ike. What's happening? They're relaying a broadcast from Rome. It's King Victor Emmanuel. The king is telling the Italian people that Benito Mussolini has been arrested and imprisoned. He is to be placed on trial later for crimes. Humpty Dumpty just had a great fall. Yes, yes. Surprise him in Sicily and Patton's tanks were on the move. That is great. Monty and his British 8th Army, how are they doing? Still stalled somewhere in Catania. Now, Patton may be the first Allied commander to reach the Sicilian capital. Monty may have to swallow his mustache. Ike, things are so shaky in Rome. One good push and they're out of the war. If George keeps moving like this, I'll give him the command of the invasion of Italy. George is doing everything in this war I wanted to do. Pick me up in uh, about an hour. Come in. The Surgeon General's here to see you, sir. We'll send him in, please. Kay. You're looking better. But that moth-eaten uniform is uh, a disgrace. Uh, well, it's impossible to get a new one, sir. I've tried. Commander has privileges here. I'm having a couple of uniforms made up here, and there'll be enough cloth left over to make some for you. I finished with crying, General. You don't have to give me any more lollies. Oh, damn it, Kay. Don't hit back. Can't you accept a little kindness? I loved him so much. Well, it's not going to do either one of you any good anymore. I don't want to sound cruel. But we all have to learn to live with death. It's all around us here. I can't compare my grief with yours. But it's just as real. You've lost someone you love dearly. And every day of this war, I have to send more kids I never knew to an early grave. Now, damn it, Kay. There are moments when everyone needs affection and compassion. General. I would absolutely adore a new uniform, General. That's better. I'll send the Surgeon General in to see you.
Pat has an absolute genius for doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. Yes. You know what General Glacé told me? What? Pat has just slapped two soldiers in a hospital in Sicily because they started to cry. He claims that they're cowards and crybabies and that there's no such thing as, uh, as battle fatigue. But one of the men had malaria and a temperature of 102. No, this is really awful. I'm going to write George a letter that'll tear his hide off. It's a lesson, though. We're all under tremendous pressure here. Sometimes we say and do things we don't really mean. Do you understand? I haven't the foggiest notion of what you're talking about, General. I'm talking about this morning, and you know it. I was about to make a, a damn fool out of myself. Call it battle fatigue. George Patton says there's no such thing. I saw the look on your face when you picked him up, and I felt very sad. I don't think I could ever show as much feeling over a person openly as you showed over this fool dog. General, you have a surprise visitor. Good job, but the Prime Minister looks happy. Prime Minister. In here, I come in. Where are you, Mr. Prime Minister? Right here, in this concubine swimming pool. The only reason why I come to North Africa is to take a decent bath, General, you must know that. With the bloody water rationing in London, it is illegal to fill the tub. And with the fuel rationing, it is impossible to heat the water. Given that combination, Mrs. Churchill sends me abroad at monthly intervals in the interests of self-preservation. Hers. Uh, I went well after the uh, purification ceremony is done. Uh, uh, we're going to have a good old-fashioned Donnybrook, firing broadsides right and left. And as former First Lord of the Admiralty, I feel more at home uh, afloat. Uh, take a seat. Let's have it, each other. Open fire. I want to win this store aid to convince that stubborn hotel that he is absolutely wrong on a major decision. What I am referring to is the timing of the invasion of Europe across the Channel. Don't you agree that next spring is too soon? Absolutely not. Now, I'm not the same country boy you out slickered at King Arthur's court. I've learned to tell which shell you put the little pea under. Now, you're reneging on your promise to invade France, which is absolutely necessary to win this war. And I'll tell you this, I'm not gonna let you bamboozle me again. My dear Ike, you cannot ignore the solid military realities. Forget the channel. I suggest instead a strike northward from Italy into Yugoslavia and then onwards through Austria to Berlin. Will you hand me that, sir? That's a political strategy, not military. To keep Stalin out of Western Europe. General Eisenhower, 
Not my words. If the Red Army reaches Berlin first, Russia will hold half of Europe in its iron fist and will never relinquish it. You don't win wars by betraying allies. Now, unless Overlord takes place next spring, as you agreed, I'm informing the Joint Chiefs I'll be no part of it. My dear General, that may be the best solution of all. The leader of Overlord will be decided in Cairo, where Mr. Roosevelt and I are to meet. If you persist in your stubbornness, if the invasion is not postponed, I have it in mind to give its leadership to that brilliant soldier, Lieutenant General Sir Bernard Montgomery. You don't have the authority to do that alone. You'll have to ask Roosevelt first. My dear, I do not fret. I have no doubts as to my own power of persuasion. In all her wars, Britain and her Prime Ministers always win one battle. The last. It's a lovely day. Yes, sir. Okay, lady, you can get out of the car. I beg your pardon? Sergeant, here's my drive the president. This is General Eisenhower's car, and I am the general's driver. I was informed the president was his guest, and I would be driving him. Well, you've been informed wrong, lady. I think, will you no, me? no woman ever drives the president. What's the Secret Service doing to that lovely girl? True. I'm thinking of you, stupid man. I say, Mr. President, what's that uh, lovely girl doing to your secret service? <laughs> Let her go, soldiers. Yes, sir. Okay, Sergeant, start it up. Drone no lousy Cadillac before. They got the gear shift here on the steering wheel. What the hell is first? You stupid sand sack, you don't even know where first gear is? Okay, Einstein, you're so smart, you'll find it. I would suggest, Mr. Riley, you consult my driver, Miss Summersby. She seems to be very good at that sort of thing. Yes, General. Hey, Summersby. Sergeant here can't seem to find first gear. Excuse me, Sergeant. Put in the clutch. You do know where the clutch is. Yes, ma'am. First. Second. Third. Reverse. Thank you, Sir Murphy. Up the Republic, Riley. I may consider her for the Medal of Honor. The President of the United States has uh, officially informed the Secret Service that you're to drive for us from now on. Oh. <laughs> We're to tour some battlefields this afternoon. Well, please thank him for me. I... Has he, um, has he given any hint as to who will command the invasion of Europe? No, but uh, he's expressed great admiration several times for General Marshall. Oh. Who's going? Just you, me, the dog, 
Military escort, Secret Service, and Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Alone at last. Winston was outgunned. The invasion of France will go forward across the channel as scheduled. Child? Child? Me? Oh, good heavens. You are a woman and therefore a child. There's a lovely grove of trees, the only one I've seen for 50 miles. Let's have our picnic there. Uh, Mr. President, we have a guarded area set up 10 miles ahead. Rubbish. The closest enemy soldiers are in Italy. That grove is as safe as... Pennsylvania Avenue. <laughs> he is the commander-in-chief, you know. <laughs> Over here, Malone. Won't you come back here, child? and have lunch with a dull old man. It's all right, Kay. I don't think that was meant to be a proposition. Oh, how disappointing. General Eisenhower tells me he may lose you. Beg your pardon? Oh, this suggested business of no more British drivers for the American military? Oh, oh, yes, yes. Why don't you join our army? The wax? Oh, but that's impossible. I'd have to become an American citizen first. <laughs> that takes years. Not if it's by executive order, I've been told. Well, there are certain things I am allowed to do without the permission of the Secret Service. Well, that is awfully kind of you, Mr. President, but... But, come, come, but what? There are some of us in this world who are proud to be British. No thank you, Mr. President. <laughs> I told you she'd be difficult. Don't you see any merit in becoming an American citizen? You do make better coffee. <laughs> oh, dear. Even presidents must wait while Tellet goes to the loo. You'll excuse us? I doubt that I have much choice. You can never win an argument with a woman, Mr. President. Well, I could have explained to her that there are reasons for being proud of being an American. Proud that we are about to give Britain the best of America's youth this coming spring to finally launch that massive assault across the English Channel. And proud that all Allied forces in the assault, including the British, will be under the command of one American, General Dwight David Eisenhower. Congratulations, Ike. The honor was long overdue. Thank you, sir. I hope I won't disappoint you, but you know I'll try my damnedest. But tell me, how did you convince Churchill to, uh, to change his mind? I did my damnedest, and that's pretty good, you know. Is there any dessert? Under the continent of Europe, and in conjunction with other United Nations, undertake operations aimed at the heart of Germany and the destruction of her armed forces. Oh. Happy New Year, right? I certainly hope so. General, it's your New Year's Eve party. No old coward and Gertie Lawrence are on it. Oh, right, that's right. No war in history's worth missing Noel and Gertie for. Oh, my travel orders come, bring them to me immediately. Even if you have to interrupt all Lang Syne. Right. But it seems such a shame when the English claim the earth that they can rise to such hilarity and never. Oh dear, oh dear. Mad dogs and Englishmen go out to make this one. The toughest Burmese bandit can never understand it. In Rangoon, the heat of noon is just what the natives shun. They put their scotch all right out and lie down. In the gentle town, when the sun beats down to the rage of man and beast, the English garb of the English sar merely gets a bit more creased. In Bangkok, at 12 o'clock, they open the mouth and don't run! But dogs and Englishmen go out in the midday sun, the smallest Malay rabbit deplores the stupid habit. In Hong Kong, they strike a gong and fire off a new league gun. To reprimand each inmate who is in late. 
In the mangrove swamps where the python romp, there is peace from 12 to 2. Even caribous lie around and snooze, there's nothing else to do. In Bengal, to move at all is seldom, if ever, done. Out in the midday, 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 out in stickily sentimental song that comes back to haunt me on occasions like this. I didn't write it for wartime, but I didn't expect there would be a wartime. I do hope there won't be another wartime, but there probably will be, man being what he is. And this song will probably still be played, soldiers being what they are, and love being eternal, or so it is claimed. And so this, perhaps, is all that will be remembered of my life's work. You will take good care of yourself, won't you? Don't smoke so many cigarettes. Don't let the Germans shoot your plane down. There won't be any Germans. I'm heading for Washington. Washington? Ah. That means your wife. It's been a hell of an affair, this one. The Virgin Mary at Armageddon. Do you know you've never said anything to me you couldn't have said while saluting? I'm not good at that sort of thing. I'm very good at it. I miss it. General, with all my heart, good luck. Thank you. two years that I've been fighting for the Channel Invasion. I never once considered what to do if it failed. I'm considering now. My God, there could be a half a million of our boys dead on the beaches of France. And I'm the one who insisted that the responsibility of the entire enterprise must go to one man. No. 
no, no. If I can't go, you certainly can't. secret orders. The Germans are supposed to think I'm in London. There is another war, you know, out there in the Pacific. That's that big ocean over there somewhere. My joint chiefs tell me that any assault on the main island of Japan will require a force of at least a million men. We can't spare Europe any additional landing craft, not one. Damn it, Mr. President, that's robbing Peter to pay Paul. We're giving you the exact number of invasion craft you asked for. You helped draw up the original estimates for the invasion of France across the Channel, remember? But I didn't know I would be commanding it. Oh. <coughs> oh, thank you. Thank you for that moment of honesty, Ike. You don't know how few there are like you. I will try to get you everything you need. But in the matter of shipping, my hands are tied. Mr. President, how can I convince all of you here in Washington, unless we attack soon and with overwhelming force, the Germans will drive us back and gain time, time to develop the secret weapons that Hitler's been boasting about? Rockets. I know, I, I know. Or hit London, possibly New York. Give us the landing craft. No. You're going to do it with what you've got. Ike, I do realize the terrible pressures you're working under. I will do everything I can to make it easier for you to bear them. Thank you, Mr. President. And I sincerely trust you get over this illness quickly. Oh, I haven't felt better in years. I'm only humoring the doctors. <laughs> Oh, I, I wonder if you'd do a favor for me. Of course, sir. Would you take this to Miss Summersby for me? I promised it to her in Algiers. I imagine you'll be seeing her. Yes, sir. There has been a lot of loose talk around Washington, General Eisenhower. I believe there was even some in your window in Life magazine. I want you to know I understand. Now give them hell across the English Channel. And I, I'll try to steal some boats for you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> Australian amphibious troops are landing on the island of New Guinea. Their landing craft rolling up on the Japanese-held beaches, pouring thousands of hardened troops into a battle that can only end on those other islands to the north that we call Japan. since Pearl Harbor, now steaming to battle all over the Pacific. And soon we will be island hopping closer and closer to the main Japanese objective. And our troops flying the hub, including the Flying Tigers, are taking supplies and weapons over those lofty peaks of the Himalayas to Chiang Kai-shek's forces fighting the Japanese occupiers of China. On another front, the Russian winter has shattered Hitler's hopes of conquest, as it did Napoleon's. 
and the Red Army has launched an offensive around Leningrad that is sending the Nazis staggering back into the snowdrifts of the bitter cold steppe. But the real crisis is soon to come, as everyone knows, when American and British armies launch an offensive from England itself against the continent of Europe. At long last, a second front is about to become something more than a dream. when we heard your plane was forced down. Well, at least it wasn't the Germans. <laughs> London weather. We just got your message a little while ago. I think Kay went through half the stoplights in London to make it. <laughs> then security in this place is so tight, it took 15 minutes to convince them we weren't spies. It was worth it, though, General. For a while there, we all thought we were to be abandoned to the natives in North Africa. Terribly good to be back with you. You'll never believe it, but I missed you. Now, where's the rest of the family? Where's Telek? Oh, poor Telek's there, it's dead. He was seized by the authorities and must remain in quarantine for six months. British customs have declared him a dog. Oh, in six <laughs> months he'll go stir crazy. Yes, especially if he saw the lovely new quarters the British are giving you, right there, Barton Square. The British are doing everything they can to make us feel comfortable. Well, not all the British, Ike. When your plane was forced down in Scotland, we were taking bets that Montgomery had shot you down. <laughs> he's been trying everything to take over while you were away. Well, he knows he's in command only until I return. I know that, and you know that. But not our Imperial General, I'm afraid. What's he up to now? The usual. Speeches, parades, press conferences, lectures to the primitive colonials. Wouldn't surprise me if he decided to run for king. Oh, General Smith, only we British are allowed to make jokes about the crown. Oh. You Americans should confine your criticism to our weather. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God you have a mellow. <laughs> oh, not to worry. Well, that still leaves him uh. plenty else to worry about. Aside from Monty wanting your job, Churchill still bent on postponing the invasion, the gold's still sulking, and there's a new rumor that Stalin's about to make a separate peace with Hitler. Wouldn't it be wonderful if all we had to fight was the Germans? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not staying in a bordello. <laughs> or uh, pillowcases and pink bed sheets. I'm moving back to Telegraph County tomorrow. <laughs> oh, thanks, Mickey. Just what I need. You better get some rest. We're packing again in the morning. Yes, sir. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, I'm going to go to bed, too. I think. Uh, I don't know how you do it. We've been traveling 35 hours. I'm beat. Yeah, I think it's time to turn in. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night, General. Sleep well. Kay, I'd like to talk to you about some things. Would you care to stay a minute and have a nightcap with me? Well, I thought you'd never ask. Gin and it. Always. It's the only British drink you know how to make. <laughs> Word to the wise. It's no good. You're going to get swept under the rug of American history. I understand I'll have a lot of distinguished company under that rug. And that still doesn't change anything for you. Well, it would for me. Yes, but then you're not a woman. I've been uh, ordered to present you with a gift President of the United States. Oh, how kind of the President to remember. And not hold the Revolutionary War against me. That's because America won that one. <laughs> Cheers. Here's to winning this one together. Kay, coming back from Washington. I made up my mind to order you back driving for two spats. Just like that? No, not just like that. Not just like that at all. There's been a lot of talk about us, Kay, in Washington. 
Even the president mentioned it. Goodness, is there nothing better for American intelligence to do? I'm actually flattered. So, you've made up your mind to get rid of me. Yes. I changed it back the minute I saw you waiting for me at the station. Careful, General. You're in serious danger of becoming a human being. About time. My God, if I ran the war this way, it would be in New York by now. <laughs> in New York, he would last ten minutes. You don't have to stay on, Kay. I don't want to see you hurt. Well, too late for that. I'm already one of the walking wounded. You're a very attractive woman, Kay. As long as you're on my staff, there's going to be a lot of talk. I can take all that. As long as I know I'm still needed. At least let me have that. You're needed. But when this war's over, and I go back home, I'll still be a soldier and a father. And a husband. Yes. Whatever happiness we have together only lasts as long as the war. My God, Ike. They raise a lot of corn in Abilene, don't they? Well, it's honest corn. My dear General Dwight David Eisenhower, I don't know what kind of women have been in love with you before, but this woman loves with all her heart. Which is why she's always hurt, but... Ah, lovely, lovely days between. Then you'll stay around. You continue to do your job, which is nothing short of saving decency and honor and the England I love. And I will do mine is infinitely less. It simply involves loving you so much that I don't care at all what happens to me. Kay. Damn it, Kay. Thank you. Shakespeare couldn't have put it better. I like you've got another command performance. Good old Winnie. <laughs> yeah, he phoned. He wants you to meet him again on his home field, King Arthur's castle. Sounds like trouble. I haven't got time to fight the Churchill. I've got to worry about Hitler and Rommel. And believe me, I do worry about them. Is that all? Tell 
Churchill, I'll be there. It's all right. I've brought the West Point varsity. Let's go, Brad. Good luck, General Bradley. I'm afraid you'll need it. I thought you'd be rooting for an American defeat. Oh, no. I hope I've seen the last of theirs. My dear friend Hitler, she could go with the house painter, has given General Orwell a free hand to increase the strength and firepower of the fortresses facing the English Channel. This is German news really recently secured. The Germans want you to have it. It's propaganda. Perhaps. But those huge cannon are not manufactured in Hollywood. This is really General Erwin Rommel. Those tank traps and mines are painfully real. Thank you, Corporal. Turn it off. I take it you've come here to face us with a final and fateful decision. Yes. Those fortifications you have just seen make any attack so costly in human lives, we must seriously re-examine the whole question of a massive frontal assault against the beaches of France. Mr. Prime Minister, we've postponed long enough. Are you prepared to tell that to a million widows of the men you throw onto that devil's beach? I don't think there'll be any million casualties. You're quite sure of that, General? I don't care how many defenses Rommel builds up. Without enough men behind them, we can't be stopped. But he does have men, and damned good ones. But not enough, Brad. We're gonna make sure the Germans won't know where the invasion's coming from. Now, they'll have to station units from Norway all the way down to Spain. Now, that's thousands of miles of beaches, bays, inlets, fjords. And then simultaneously, we plan on hitting the Germans with a second invasion into the south of France. That will... Two try. invasions? Absolutely insane. No, we don't think so. We can trap half the German divisions in France between the two of them. Oh, yes, and take so many men and landing craft away from the main invasion across the channel that both will be doomed. This is lunacy. Not if we can drop enough men behind those fortifications to knock them out before D-Day. Our people say that you have selected landing grounds completely unsuitable for glider landings and targets for your paratroopers impossible to hit in darkness. Your 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions will suffer 70% losses in glider strength and at least 50% losses in paratroop strength before they even hit the ground. Yeah, yeah. Very impressive figures, but only figures. Gentlemen, gentlemen, you'll find, I believe, in total democracy in these decisions. I'm perfectly willing to hear everyone out before having my own way. Then what is your own way? We already have forces on the continent in Italy. I suggest they strike northward into Germany and enter Berlin by the back door. Mr. Prime Minister, the Russian army is a lot closer to Berlin than we are. That, my dear General, is precisely the point. If you want to beat the Russians to Berlin, that's a political decision and not a military one. I'll have no part of it. Oh, and do your orders suggest handing half of Europe over to the Russians? My orders are simple. Enter the continent across the channel. Aim at the heart of Germany, not her rear end. It's the only way to put the German army in a nutcracker between ourselves and the Russians. The only way, the only way. How well I remember our general saying that in the First World War. You can't fight World War II with World War I thinking. If the Russian army gains control of Western Europe, we'd all better start thinking of World War III. We've got to fight this war first. The impregnable West Wall. The hell with the West Wall. There are no longer any fixed defenses. There are no longer unlimited British lives to throw against them. Your plan is too risky. It must be called off now. Mr. Prime Minister, you promised our president that England would join in the assault across the channel. I may have then, and I may have changed my mind now. A politician's prerogative. Well, sir, I'm a soldier, not a politician. And my mind has not changed from the very beginning. My title is Supreme Commander. Now, does that mean anything? Is this my military command, or is it yours alone? If it isn't mine, you British have my resignation here and now. Are you asking the First Minister of the British Empire for unconditional surrender? I'm asking for him to live up to his word. Sometimes, my dear, I, 
that is even more difficult. But I take no satisfaction in gaining my way if I know my way is in fear. Don't start being reasonable. You only make it tougher. That's my intention. All right. This is how I see it. General Montgomery is absolutely right. We don't have enough landing craft to conduct two invasions at once. We'll take those intended for southern France and use them for the channel instead. My military consultant, Mr. Churchill, is also right. The West Wall has been strengthened too much. So we'll put two extra divisions on those landing craft and hit the beaches on schedule. I, you've become a very dangerous man. The time to get off our tails has arrived. You have learned my secret of making any compromise that will let you get your own way. You're learning to be a politician. Someday, I do not doubt, you will run for president. God forbid. Prime Minister, I still feel we're not to for God's but... sake, it's settled, done. I am in this thing with you to the end. And if it fails, we will go down together. This is Lowell Thomas in London again. The two teams are getting ready for that big game. This one is not to be the Rose Bowl. It will be more like Daphne's Inferno. It is no longer a military secret that the Allies under General Eisenhower are planning to invade Hitler's Europe sometime this spring or summer. The massive supplies from the United States have been streaming across the Atlantic in ever-growing convoys. England has become an armed camp. Her coastal areas have been declared off-bounds to all civilians, including newsmen like myself. As for Adolf Hitler, he has tightened the screws on the occupied countries in an attempt to destroy their underground forces. Frenchmen by the hundreds have been going to the Gestapo's gallows, and human shipments to the concentration camps from Holland, from Belgium, from Poland, are increasing in size and cruelty every day. The German army under Rommel has been strengthening the massive Atlantic Wall and increasing the Panzer units in the West, some of them recalled from the Russian front. The forces of good will soon meet the forces of evil on the playing fields of Europe, and the outcome will decide the future of free men for centuries. Tex, just leave it. <clears throat> it's something personal, but uh, with the invasion so close, I, I figure it's now or never for me. Wondered if you might reconsider. That again. Will I transfer you to a combat unit? Yes, sir. No. I can't. I don't want to miss this show. I'm a soldier. I'm not an office boy. The world's on fire, and I'm sitting here with a squirt gun. No. And I want to say it again. Look, Tex, I do understand. I don't want this. I'm sitting back here because General Marshall says sit. And if I say keep shuffling papers, you keep shuffling. Understand? Understood. How's his mood? I don't think it's about to improve. Patent's here. Beetle. Six weeks till D-Day. And our supplies aren't complete yet. Oh, we're on schedule. I don't worry. My God, I wish I were eating the assault instead of sitting here. Well, you can't fight a war with all Indians and no chiefs. I know. I was just saying the same thing to Tex. Anything new in the Gaul? No, still stuck in the same groove. He won't help with the invasion unless FDR lets him run the French show. Any more good news? Yes. Old blood and guts is here. I'll tell him to cool his heels for a few minutes. It's good for the soul. I don't have a soul, Ike, and you know it. Now, put me up in a firing squad, and let's get this whole thing over with, whatever it is. Whatever it is? You shoot your mouth off about the English and us dividing up the world after the war. 
You forget about our Russian ally, remember? They've been thinking of burying you in Lenin's tomb. He's agreed to uh, move over. We're just talking to a bunch of women. Didn't know some of them were reporters. George, you put your foot in your mouth more often than a jackass in a fucking contest. I thought maybe finally you had learned your lesson. Now remember what you wrote me after you slapped those two soldiers in the hospital? I apologized at nine. Two yellow lily looking cowards. That's just what I'm talking about. I brave men don't cry. I mean, there were courageous lads dying in the beds all around them. Teaching those whiners a lesson, that's all. Don't forget about that. Put yourself in my place now, parading up and down the southern coast, taking phony photographs, issuing phony orders. There's a reason for all that. So the Krauts will think that I'm commanding the invasion and we're going to hit them at Calais, when all the time it's Monty who's going to command the invasion and hit them in Normandy. And I'm nothing but a department store dummy. Throw up every night just thinking about it. Like... I am ten times the leader that that little British tin soldier is, and you know it. And that little British tin soldier has ten times as much sense as you have, plus Winston Churchill and the whole British Empire behind you. Ike, give me a command, a battalion. That's not the point, George. A company, a platoon. That's not the point. They want you to ship me back, don't they? Huh? All those kissy, kissy brass buttons. George, will you shut up? I'll apologize. I'll make a public apology to the Russians. They won't be upset. Not upset, furious. And not just the Russians. FDR, Congress, the press, and George Marshall. Marshall. Well, I've really done it this time, haven't I? Marshall is nailing you to the wall because of me, isn't he? I really wanted was a chance to redeem myself. I wanted to take a column of tanks and kick the living hell out of those obscene supermen. I wanted my boys to march down the Unter der Linden and show those goose-stepping Krauts how to win a war. God knows I don't want to sit out the rest of the only war I was born in the right century for. But I'm sick to the stomach to think of what my big mouth has caused you in the way of trouble. So, I will do the only thing that can help you. I am resigning my commission as an officer in the United States Army, effective immediately. The biggest amphibious operation in history is about to be launched. And I need all the help man and God can give me. You taught me everything I know about tank warfare, George. You wrote the book. I'm giving you immediate command of the United States Third Army. Just keep your big mouth shut and get me some victories. So everyone will think I'm a genius. Because for once what you said made sense, my job is on the line too. So remember, don't let me down. See how wrong you were, George? Brave men do cry. Gentlemen, His Majesty the King. We are gathered here in old St. Paul's School, the leaders of the armed forces of the nations of the free world. England, which once stood alone, 
greets with gratitude and hope the military commanders of the Commonwealth nations of Australia, Canada, India, New Zealand, the Republic of China, the nation of Czechoslovakia, the Republic of France, the nation of Holland, the nation of Italy, the nation of Poland, the Union of South Africa, and the United States of America. We are alone no longer. Ah. We must never underrate the power of the German machine. I, for one, long had my doubts about confronting it along the Channel Coast. But, gentlemen, I am hardening towards this enterprise. The fearsome task must be done, and it must be done soon. I shall only repeat what I said in England's darkest hour. Let the great cities of Paris, of Rome, of Warsaw, of Prague, of Vienna, banish despair. Their liberation is sure. The day will come when the joy bells will ring again throughout Europe and when victorious nations will plan and build in justice, in tradition, and in freedom. A house of many mansions where there will be room for all. Gentlemen, the entire front of our attack will be over 60 miles long. The Americans will be on the right at Utah Beach and Omaha Beach. The British and Canadian forces will be on the left at Gove, Juneau and Sword Beaches. By the end of the first day, we hope to break out our armoured forces in the area beyond Caen, where our British tanks can knock about a bit. The landings will include 156,000 men, 5,000 ships, and 11,000 aircraft. Participating eventually will be a total force of 2 million men. Good hunting, all. We must cross the channel with our convoys at night. We need moonlight for our airborne assaults, and we must attack at low tide in order to remove the tank traps along the beaches. Only two periods next month offer the proper combination of moon, tide, and sunrise. June 5th, 6th, and 7th. June 19th, 20th, and 21st. Without good weather and the help of the French people, none of our plans can succeed. So the next few weeks will tell if the Lord is on our side. He's right not to want to cooperate. Hm. Would not make any difference to Charlie the Gold if he was in the wrong. He would never be swayed by anything so mundane as common sense or logic. Unfortunately, the Almighty in his wisdom did not see fit to create Frenchmen in the image of Englishmen. But he's got to uh, broadcast to the French resistance before we start landing. He's the only one to listen to. The problem is, my dear General, he knows it too. He looks as sore as a mule with a burr up his saddle. <laughs> Exquisitely phrase. Well, I've done all I can with it. It's now your turn. What do you think I should do? Charming, my dear, I charming. Ah, oh, mon general, enchanté! Right this way, mon general. A 
Uh, Hitler, we hope, has been tricked into believing our assault will land here in the Pas de Calais. Now, on D-Day, we're sending hundreds of ships and bombers in that direction, as though the invasion force was going that way. But in reality, our objective is the beaches of Normandy here. General de Gaulle, you will have the uh, honor on D-Day of making the first broadcast of the French underground and the French people to help us in every way. Within 48 hours, weather permitting, Allied armies will be on French soil. By whose authority? By my authority, with the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. And by the authority of the President of the United States. Did anyone bother to consult the people of France for their authority? Only Charles de Gaulle has the right to give them orders. Until this very day, I have been kept away in Algiers, in ignorance of your plans for my country, because I refuse to allow Monsieur Roosevelt to choose the leader of France. My dear General de Gaulle. I have not finished. On D-Day, acting under the instructions of your president, you intend to take control of my country. And Monsieur Churchill will approve. You expect Charles de Gaulle to cooperate? Je ne suis pas fou. I am not insane. I have not come here for my daily French dictate lesson, General. A pity. A fact. How do you expect Britain to take a position separate from the United States? How do you expect de Gaulle to take a position separate from the destiny of France? But we don't, sir. Oh. And do you speak for Monsieur Churchill? Has he separated himself from the destiny of England? Never. This is something you should know. Each time we must choose between Europe and the open sea, we shall always choose the open sea. Each time I must choose between you and Roosevelt, I shall always choose Roosevelt. And now you propose to give me an English dictate lesson. I propose to give you nothing but the facts of life. Will you accept them and use the tremendous influence you have with the people of France to broadcast a message to them, to cooperate with the Allied forces to the utmost? Or will you play dog in the manger? and make it well-nigh impossible for us to bring France the freedom she so desperately deserves. Freedom? What kind of freedom is it when the British government is already printing French money to be used in my country by your occupying armies? Only a practicality, General... Uh, An General... insult! I shall order the people of France not to honor one centime! General de Gaulle, I never understood before why Joan of Arc was burned at the stake. Thank you for correcting my ignorance for a while. And the best of British luck to you, I... Soldier to soldier. On D Day, men of the American 82nd and 101st Airborne will be jumping at night near some air release. Now, when they land with the best of luck, they'll be helpless for 40 seconds while getting out of their chutes. Many will die in that 40 seconds unless they get help. From French men? Yes. From your French underground. That's the only place help can come. Only you can give the order. Asking for that help, General de Gaulle. Without it, the invasion could fail. First, I must be recognized as the sole authority in my country. You don't need me to give you that authority? You don't need Roosevelt, you don't need Churchill. You have it. And Roosevelt knows that, even if he won't accept it publicly. Then he must be helped to accept it. In fact... Well, what are you asking me to do? To give my word that I'll defy the President of the United States? Well, damn it, I'll put my job on the line right now and tell you that I will accept no power in France except Charles de Gaulle. You will oppose your own president, your commander-in-chief, if that's what I have to do, yes. I have that power under military necessity. This is no time for politics. And your free French troops will be the first into Paris when we liberate it. You have my promise. Now, this is what I'm going to say in my broadcast to France on D-Day. You can change it any way you want if you think I'm trying to uh, steal your thunder. Now, will you go on the radio, too? And will you personally order the French underground and the French people to help us? The success of D-Day may depend on your broadcast. I will read this over and make my decision.
the west over the channel, gusting over 40 miles per hour. Precipitation 2.11 inches, continuing heavy. It's foul weather. The birds are not only walking, some of them, I don't doubt, are swimming. What about tomorrow, John? Well, it's not good, but it's not altogether bad. Someone's gone and knocked a bloody big hole in the weather, and if I were a chuff going man, I might have an explanation. But as a scientist, I can only report facts. It should begin to clear, and we should have some relatively good weather, lasting perhaps 36 hours. After which, it should return to its present foul and British nature, as there is another storm in the North Atlantic on its way in. Mind you, meteorology is not yet an exact science. I wouldn't throw away my galoshes yet if I were you. There's just a chance it could be wrong. On the other hand, I could be right. Will our gliders and pair troops have low enough winds and sufficient visibility uh, to land? Truthfully, I can't say. Maybe yes, maybe no. Will you take milk or lemon? Or don't you care to protect? Milk. Captain Burns, three airborne divisions will be landing in this weather of yours. Now, exactly what will it be like tomorrow? over the channel on the French coast. This is life or death for a quarter of a million kids. I need an answer. To answer that question, sir, I'd have to be a fortune teller. Not a meteorologist. I have no talent for tea leaves, General Eisenhower. Well, you must have a talent for something or you wouldn't be here. Now, this storm coming from the west, would the Germans know when it'll end? No, sir. We have weather stations to the west of the British Isles. The Germans don't. What would they think? If they're watching their barometers, they'd probably think that anyone who'd launch an air or sea attack in the next few days would have to be daft. If we postpone again, it'll be two weeks before moon and tides are favorable. Yes, two weeks. Weather permitting. weather's going to lift. I'm afraid, I, I, I think it's highly questionable. Monty? If I were you, I, I would say go. Fortunately, I'm not you. Mallory? If the weather blows our gliders and paratroopers off target, we stand to lose half a million lives, and possibly the war. It's much too chancy, General. Okay, we'll go. Give me a few minutes alone out there. A lot of these boys aren't coming back. They know damn well whose idea this airdrop was. They may not be very happy to see me, but I gotta see them. Yes, sir. Okay. Cover up the stars on the license plate. There are no generals here nice day. Of course. Sir, Ike, it's going to clear. You have my word. I told him not to do this. He has to. Hey, 
That's right. Anybody got a spare cigarette? Thanks. Best part about my job is I get to shake hands with a lot of brave men. Hey, Ike! Would you autograph my shorts in order for me, please, sir? How did you save this much money in the Army? Well, I don't like girls, sir. <laughs> Anybody here from Kansas? Ain't that in Texas someplace? Maybe they bought it. <laughs> Texas is all right. I, I was born there. I'm from Waco. Waco, how are you, son? It's a good ranch country. You got it. My old man runs 600 head of only Longhorns. Well, uh, if you need an extra hand, I may ask for a job after we win this war. <laughs> well, if I'm not there, I just ask my old man. We're with you all the way, I Look out, Hitler, here we come. Yes, sir. Yeah, we're all the way. Picture is a dramatization based on fact. Events have been recreated and certain names and characters have been changed. He was the greatest American hero of the 20th century. He was Ike. Okay, we'll go. That's right! And his true story was a sprawling epic of courage and determination that shaped nations and changed history forever. Best part about my job is I get to shake hands with a lot of brave men. Both of us so terribly alone, General. 
I make the command decisions around here. My God, there could be a half a million of our boys dead on the beaches of France. Well, it's on. No one can stop it now. I am ten times the leader that that little British tin soldier is. Your plan is too risky. It must be called off now. There isn't room enough for both of us in this command. For once, you may be right. Give them hell across the English Channel. It takes killing to stop this. Yes, I believe. Tomorrow, John Eisenhower graduates from West Point, second lieutenant. I hope tomorrow he's still proud of his old man. I bought you some of your penny dreadful westerns at the the other day. I honestly don't know how reading this dreadful rubbish can soothe you, but why don't you try? What time is it? Those 300. Don't you think you should chase us all out and try to get some sleep? I can't understand why we haven't heard from the 101st. Mallory said he'd phone as soon as they made radio contact. And well, what worries me is De Gaulle. Will he ask the French underground to help us? Well, you better. I only put my neck in the chopping block. I promised him everything but uh, a key to the White House latrine. <laughs> well, worrying won't help. I suggest as our contribution to the war effort, we turn in. I think that's an excellent suggestion. All right. Okay. Thank you. Hey. Uh, do I have any cigarettes left? Suppose it should fail. Can't. No. What if the weather changes and our landing boats capsize? What if the wind blows our paratroops into a panzer division? Or what if de Gaulle doesn't make that broadcast? Now, what if, what if a dozen things I hadn't thought about happened? Now, who made the decisions? I did. Tomorrow, John Eisenhower graduates from West Point, the second lieutenant. I hope tomorrow he's still proud of his old man. If we're not off those beaches in a few days, tens of thousands of boys, just like my son, will have died. Ike, you didn't invent war. You didn't even start this one. I will not let you take the entire blame for World War II on your shoulders. Leave some guilt for the rest of us. Thank you, Kay. You always bring a breath of sanity into the asylum. You look tired, Kay. How do you feel? Sweet. Very serene. Unbelievably happy. When I was helping to pull those poor mangled creatures from the Blitz, I remember thinking, you bastard Hitler, someday we'll come and get you. And now we are. And he will know that England is not France, and America is not Belgium, and Kay Summersby is not to be trifled with. I learned that a long time ago. Oh, how? When? Well, for starters, that uh, khaki nail polish or varnish. Oh, that was bloody rude of me, wasn't it? Terribly rude. And so was getting yourself torpedoed. Well, I hadn't really planned on that, you know. Well, I hadn't planned on getting so upset when I heard about it. I'm out of cigarettes. No, you're not. 
ration. I've been giving you my ration all along. What time? It's um, 58 seconds later than when you asked me the last time. Read this. What is it, your last will and testament? Almost. Our landings in the Schoberg Harbor area have failed to gain satisfactory foothold. You don't know that yet. Just read it, Kay. And I have withdrawn the troops. My decision to attack at this time and place was based upon the best information available. The troops, the air, and the navy did all that bravery and devotion to duty could do. If any blame or fault attaches to the attempt, it is mine alone. Dwight David Eisenhower, Southwick, England, June 6, 1944. How noble. Burn it. Kay, don't you ever bother to beat around the bush. You are Ike Eisenhower, even though you don't seem to know what that means yet. You've done everything you could do. Kay, thank you for being here. For everything. I can't say a thing the way I'd like to. Don't expect it from me. Oh, goodness. I didn't even expect you to say that you couldn't say them. Do you know how much I want this to go right for you? So much that I don't even care that when this war is over. You will shake my hand, just as you shook the hands of so many of those brave lads today, and send me off, as you sent them. Good night, General. I'm going to bed now. Nothing further I can do about your tomorrow. Or mine. British Broadcasting Corporation. Here is a news bulletin. Radio Berlin has just announced that Allied paratroops are landing in great force on the continent of Europe. We switch you now to our London studios. This is the overseas service of the BBC broadcasting to the people of France. Ici Londres, TSF de la BBC. Citoyens de la France, Le général Charles de Gaulle. Français, la bataille suprême est engagée. The supreme battle has begun. After so much fighting, so much fury, so much suffering, here at last is the decisive blow. I ask you to give your help to the brave soldiers of our good friends, the English, the Americans, down with the Germans.
The first of a series of landings in ports upon the European continent has taken place. In this case, the liberating assault fell upon the coast of France. So far, the commanders who are engaged report that everything is going according to plan. And what a plan. This tremendous operation is undoubtedly the most complicated and difficult that has ever been attempted in the vast history of warfare. Broadcasting, we landed at the Pas de Calais instead of Normandy, where we actually hit it. Oh. And? Casually, the light. I mean, light, a couple of thousand. Oh, wonderful. It's not those poor chaps who bought it, but I was worried we'd lose 20 times that many. Oh, what about the 101st Airborne? No word yet. Why are you so gloomy, for heaven's sakes? We're ashore, Tex. We're ashore in France. Ah. Okay, someday I'm going to have kids. And uh, they're going to ask Daddy what he did on D Day. Now I'll have to tell him. Ah. These two fingers. I typed up the general's requisition for more toilet tissue. Of course. How stupid of me. Why is it that all men who are totally unsuited for war want so desperately to get themselves killed? That's a hell of a lot better than a purple heart for getting your thumb caught in a mimeograph Well, machine. I won't listen to your pessimism on such an historic morning. Look at this glorious sunshine. I must go in and congratulate Ike on his weather. Okay. He doesn't belong to you. He's an old line. He now belongs to the world. 
My dear Colonel Lee, you've missed the entire point. I belong to him. Thank you. Thank you. That was Lee Mallory. Boys of the 101st, mate. Oh! So did the rest of the Airborne. It wasn't perfect, but they're fighting their way through. The French are with... I, you must be so proud of them. And of yourselves. I'm so happy I could cry. For all of them. For all of us. Uh, On top of it all, Rome has finally fallen. It's no longer the end of the beginning. It's the beginning of the end. You're quite right. Beginning of the end. from Berlin just one week after your costly assault on the coast of France. I'm sure you've all heard the good news by now. Our Führer, Adolf Hitler, has been promising you some secret weapons for a long time. But unlike the bloated aristocrat Churchill and the Jew Roosevelt, his promises are always kept. I know how thrilled you must be to watch the first of our bombs arriving in London without warning. What a lovely surprise on a fine June evening. It does no good to shoot them down. They have no pilots. And you can't tell where they're going to land because we really don't know ourselves. All we know is they'll land on you. They're a barrel of laughs, London. Roll out the barrel, we'll have a barrel of fun. Roll out the barrel, we've got the blues on the run. Zing, boom, terraro, we'll have a day of good cheer. Now's the time to roll the barrel for the gang. He insists he can't move. His troops are still stalled in front of Khan. They were supposed to take Khan on D-Day. That was two weeks ago. Remember how cocky Marty was? Maybe pushing inland uh, 30 miles the 31st day. British tanks uh, knock about a bit. Yeah, we're the ones who get knocked about. Casualties are heavier by the hour. 20,000 dead, the last report. Things aren't any better for Bradley's troops near Omaha Beach. They're stymied by German tanks and guns. Brad doesn't think Sherbert soon will be shoved off the continent. Nazis will have their second Dunkirk. But this time, there may be no coming back. We need a port to land our supplies. Our artificial harbors are being capsized by the storms. And those buzz bombs are killing civilians all over London. And by the way, Ike, intelligence reports the Nazis have developed a much worse weapon. A B-2 rocket. Maybe ten times the TNT of the buzz bomb. If that's true, they'll flatten all of London in a few weeks. It's true. Be worse than the Blitz casualties in the hundreds of thousands. You really think Hitler would use weapons like that against civilians? You really think he wouldn't? Mickey, hold that frame. Beetle, Tom Montgomery, I'll be at his headquarters in the morning. Tell Bradley I'll be on Omaha Beach tomorrow afternoon. Tell them both I'm going to ask some questions, and they better have some damn good answers. Montgomery ordered me to give you a hearty welcome on behalf of His Majesty's forces. Freddy, where in the hell is Marty? Uh, called away, unfortunately. Well, he knew I was coming. He was merely following your orders not to let your visit keep him from his military duties. Well, he's absolutely right. When do you expect him to return? I suspect he'll be along shortly. In the meantime, would you care to inspect our orchard? Let's get on to Bradley. There are no orchards at Omaha Beach. Yes, sir. Hi, Colonel. 
Sorry to detain you. Hello, Monty. Time that entrance beautiful. Thank you. I knew you'd appreciate it. You do it so well yourself. Talk privately. I've got a lot to say. I'm afraid headquarters tend to somewhat crowded. Supposing we walk into the orchard. Just be careful of the cow droppings. I don't need a warning. I've had conversations with you before. <laughs> Quite so. Colonel Lee, in spite of what you may have heard, General Montgomery has a very high opinion of General Eisenhower. <laughs> From what I've heard, General Montgomery has a very high opinion of General Montgomery. <laughs> He's going to need it. Don't give me any excuses. This is a stalemate. You've been sitting here without moving for over a week. The Germans are blocking this front with everything they've got. Artillery, tanks, infantry. Now look here, Ike. I'm simply not going to attack until I have enough men to be certain of victory. You want to steal some from Bradley? Why not? He doesn't know what to do with them. Talk about stalemate. I visited his sector. He scarcely moved off the beach. Bradley should sit tight, shut up, and be given only enough supplies for his bare subsistence. He has no reserves behind the front. Morale is low. Why, his officers were delighted when I issued some firm orders. What did Bradley do? Kiss the hem of your garment? Oh, he would have done, old boy. But I was walking on water at the time. Now, what I propose is that you give me complete and permanent command of all Allied ground forces in France. Then I can concentrate the main force on this front and drive straight for Berlin. That's not the battle plan, and you know it. Well, it should be. But what do you want, my hat to? Sorry, old boy, it's too small. Monty, the worst thing that can happen to an amphibious force is to get stalled. That's what's happened to us. Now, you're supposed to be halfway through Belgium now, not sitting here waiting for my job. Sorry, old boy, but you know I don't allow smoking at my headquarters. Well, sorry, old boy, I do at mine. Taking a lot of casualties. I think we've tried to break out time and again. The Nazis are hanging on to Cherbourg like it was Berlin. What's holding up your advance, Brad? Everything. Men, weapons, Rommel. Monty thinks you ought to be removed. I know. He came around here one day like the Lord come to clean the temple. Started giving orders to some of my officers. You think he's right? Well, if he was, you've known me long enough to know that I'd be the first to let you know. Now, we've underestimated the German strength. And we should have taken Cherbourg by the fifth day. Instead, it'll be closer to the 50th. We don't have that much time. London is going under from the buzz bombs. You've got to break out now. You've got to get George Patton and his third army tanks on the road to Germany. You've got to knock out the launching pads, or else we're going to lose London. Why don't we get money to take some of the risks, too? Take some of the pressure off this front. I will. I've got to get both of you more men and weapons, or this is the beginning of a different kind of end that I never imagined. Well, it's going to take a while, I think. Look at the channel today. Well, according to our meteorologist, that wind is the edge of a gale that's going to hit this coast. Worst storm in 20 years. And it's due to hit right in the channel tomorrow morning. We're not going to be able to unload one damn ship. You may lose a few. Tomorrow would have been the date of the invasion if I'd called it off for June 6th. And Ramo would have been standing here instead of us, waiting. Every time I hear one of those German sausages. What? A lot of meat in those sausages. At least a ton of TNT. Well, well, go ahead, because I can't afford to spend half my time in a storm cellar. Well, you know damn well I'm not going to go if you're not. Look at you two trying to outbrave each other. If you've been through as many bombings as I have, you wouldn't Dinner's stand ready, right General. General. Well, who can eat now? I can't, because there's no point getting in a panic just because of a bug bomb. Please, Harry, there may be zero in on this area. Mickey, Manny, John, on the double. You're not 
immortal. You and Dick tramping through your stupid minefields. All right, Kay. May last a while. I'll enjoy you some rest. Sorry about dinner, Mickey. <laughs> Cake fell anyway, sir. Here, I... I think I'd better give it to her through channels. Oh. Thank you, Colonel. <clears throat> Did I do that all right? Uh, I'm sorry to have been so... unmilitary, but I couldn't help it. No, it isn't. Just childish. But you see, during the Blitz, you could do something. You could shoot his stupid off from under him or whatever. But those things, they just have a German engine sputtering away inside. If you do knock one down, it simply explodes and kills you. And if you don't, it switches itself off. And then there's that dreadful silence before it kills you anyway. I don't think I'll mind dying too awfully much, but I would hate to be killed by a thing. You'll never die, Kay. <laughs> I have a feeling if all of England were wiped away, you'd still be standing on the beach at Dover, daring that bastard Hitler to come over so you could spit in his eye. I would, too. <clears throat> Colonel Lee. Yes, General Eisenhower. <sighs> You're leaving for Washington tomorrow. I am? This war isn't over by a long shot. We need war, everything, and fast. And Washington's got to be made to believe it. I want you to tell General Marshall exactly how I feel. Yes, sir. And you're going to, Kay. What? Now, why would I want to go to the colonies? They're not the colonies. They're the United States of America, and it's time you found that out. Hmm. I want you to take a rest. Uh, you've earned it. You need it badly. I don't need it. Anything but to go on being here with you. I want you to go, Kay. I want you to stuff yourself with all the unrationed food you can eat. Sleep till noon if you want to. And no more bombs in a war. That's hardly possible. Kay, I've leaned on you long enough. Now lean on me a bit. I want to get you out of the war zone. Now please go. If I go, who will hold your cigarettes for you? Shut up and be grateful, Kay. Is that an order, General? Damn right. Washington Monument, dedicated to the American general. You remember him. He's the one who beat the pants off the British Army with a little ragtag group of boys. Tex, please take me back to my hotel. Well, that wouldn't be very polite. Mrs. Eisenhower was careful to point out the invitation was to both of us. Well, I'm sorry. I, I don't like cocktail parties. Oh, come on, Jay. 
It would be all right if I felt terribly guilty. I could brazen it out. Well, there's nothing to it. Just give him a big smile. Easy for you to say. I was just the escort. I'm... I'm the prize exhibit. I think this is the first time I've ever seen you scared. You are, aren't you? I'm afraid I'd be terrified of Mamie. I don't think I've done anything awful enough to feel that way, but I'm still scared. All I want to do right now is bolt for it. Well, the worst thing you can do for Ike right now is to run and hide. It'll only encourage a lot of vicious talk in this town. This town is built on vicious talk. Oh, I can't. I can't. I guess my hopeless romance can't survive reality for a moment. Okay, you, uh, you're crying, you know? I mean, I hate women who cry. And I hate men from Indiana who call themselves Tex. You care that much? I'll go. I couldn't not. But if I've shot down over a liver canopy, you will bind my wounds, won't you? I don't know. It might be kinder to let you bleed to death. Oh, well, Mrs. Eisenhower, I'm trying to recover from the shock of all this extraordinary food. And cream, real cream from real cows, I suppose. Well, yes, I believe the Wardman Park Hotel deals in authentic cream. You want to try some shrimp? They've got crab meat here, too. Oh, here. Especially barbecued ribs. Now, as a Texan from Indiana, I speak with authority. Oh, it's pastry. I cannot believe. I'm certain I'll discover it. I've died and gone to heaven when none of this is happening. <laughs> Excuse me for a minute. Oh, I'm totally disheartened. She's a lovely woman. I can't even find anything to dislike. I have confidence in you. You'll manage. <laughs> Miss Summersby. I'm Helen Westerfield. I told everyone I simply must meet Ice Lady Driver. You are his driver, aren't you? Yes, I'm also the general secretary. Oh, how convenient. Uh, you may know my husband, General Paul Westerfield. He has a command under Mark Clark in Italy. Yes, I've heard General Eisenhower speak of your husband quite often, Mrs. Westerfield. Well, we certainly talk of you quite a lot. There's so much to talk about. How nice. Okay, why don't we go get a drink? I dare say you'll soon be writing it on the lavatory walls, won't you? A martini? It may interest you to know that my husband is a major general in the regular army. While Dwight Eisenhower, although a charming, intelligent man, still holds the permanent rank of only chicken colonel. Indeed. The Italian campaign has gone dreadfully slowly, hasn't it? I've heard your husband's name mentioned around Supreme Headquarters as the chicken general. A double martini? Shut up, Tex. My dear Miss Summersby, if I were Mamie, I'd throw you right out of here. Good night. Bloody cow. I need a cigarette. Come on, I better take you back to the hotel. Oh, don't you dare. Fireworks are just beginning. Kay, that will not do any good. You've seen Ike's world now. Do you think you could fit into it? Or would you want to? <sighs> it was a hopeless little romance, wasn't it? All on my side, too. She is a lovely woman, Mamie, and so right for him. I loathe being a good sport about Ike, but I suppose I must be. I'll simply fade away. But what hurts most is that he'll probably be too busy to notice. Want me to put it in military jargon or have it typed up the way it is? Just read it back to me. For General Marshall, eyes only. We're to hell and gone in Brittany and slicing them up in Normandy. American troops under Bradley and Patton have broken through on two fronts and are on their way to Germany. I almost mentioned my bet with Churchill that the war will be over by Christmas. You still put it in. No, it's going so well, why tempt fate? Oh, superstitious, you? Uh, maybe, but so is Winnie. That's why he bet me. <laughs> We've destroyed all bridges over the Seine and are moving toward Paris. I'm setting up my forward headquarters tomorrow in France at Tournier. 
I recommend Bradley for permanent major general. If we can't do anything for Patton, he's run off the end of the tactical maps, and I can't keep up with him. He's using Michelin road maps. <laughs> what do you think, Peter? <laughs> About redoing it? No, I'd leave it the way it is. The reality comes through. Besides, with military jargon, the end of the world would come across as a requisition for paper clips. Pre-bent, size standard, box contained in. Uh, Daily Courier? No, send it special. Thanks. Welcome back from Washington, Colonel Lee. Thank you, Mickey. It's a relief to get out of the combat zone and back here to safety. <laughs> Hello, Kay. Hello. Hello. You old son of a gun. Come here, brother. Any Hello. juicy gossip while we've been away? Well, uh, there's been a lot of loose talk about me and a corporal in the wax. And all of it true. We're going to be married. <laughs> married? Oh, that's, that's lovely, Mickey. I do mean it, really. Lovely. Come in. Tell if you old Scotch son of a gun, where did you come from? <laughs> He's been a prisoner of war for six months. I was sure no one but me remembered that his sentence was up today. Tex and I picked him up on the way back from the airport. After Washington, it was so nice to see a friendly face. Mr. K. I'm worried about you. How about me? Well, I've been in the land of real milk and real honey. And I, I, I was worried about you. Coming back, we heard that one of those awful V2s landed near here. Well, just a chance hit. Yes. That's what makes it so awful. And with all those dreadful bombs falling all over London, my old unit needs drivers desperately. I've, I've applied for transfer back. Now, what's that all about? I need a driver, too. I'm sure you can find another to shout at. What do I need another driver to shout at for? Now, why, Kay, so suddenly? Something happened in the States. Didn't you expect it to? Kay, what are you talking about? It's really very strange. I'm not uh, out of love, but the thought of being without you doesn't hurt quite so much anymore. Yes. Tell him he'll have to wait. Okay, how many times do I have to tell you that I need you? Two or three dozen more would help. Why the devil did you send me away? Why did you have to ship me to the colonies and throw me to the savages? For once I got a good look at what would become of me after this war. Thousand Helen Westerfields pointing their fingers at me. Are you going to let some Washington, D.C. gossip drive you away? All right, then. If you want me to stay around in spite of that, then you must give me something tangible to hold on to. Some proof that... oh, 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 What proof do you want? I don't know. I don't know. But, but, but do something. Face the same reality I have to face. I was the one on the fire. Hey, will head. you listen to me for a moment? Now, I have something to tell you. Oh, and for God's sake, don't try to say anything sweet. Well, you know I don't know how. Maybe this will say it for me. I've arranged for you to join the American Army. Oh, good Lord, right in character. The tank corps, I suppose. How romantic. Okay. You're going to be commissioned a lieutenant in the wax, so you can stay with me till the end of this war. You know very well I refuse to join the American Army. Without giving up one iota of your precious British citizenship. Join the American Army and still remain a British subject? I believe that's impossible, General. Well, nothing's impossible if it's by order of the President of the United States. The only member of the United States Women's Army Corps in history who still owes allegiance to a foreign flag. I do not consider the flag of the British Empire to be foreign. Well, the, the president didn't mean it that way, and neither do I. Ike, what will people say? In the immortal words of Rhett Butler, frankly, Lieutenant Summersby, I don't give a damn. <laughs> The City of Light, 
free once more. On August 22nd, under General Eisenhower's orders, General de Gaulle's free French forces were allowed to be the first to enter Paris. I After told I not to let the free French tanks in first. Charles de Gaulle naturally took all the credit. And don't you think they deserved it, Mr. President? That was for the French nation to decide. American and Allied forces joining the fighting, and soon Paris was liberated. Then followed a demonstration of happiness and tears, perhaps unequaled in this or any war. General Eisenhower ordered the U.S. 28th Division on its way to battle north of Paris to detour in full battle dress down the Champs-Élysées so they could join the parade in de Gaulle's honor before entering the attack in progress against the German army. American combat troops marching in tribute were a proof of the solidarity between the United States and Charles de Gaulle that has guaranteed his position as the sole leader of his country. That's enough. That newsreel is being shown all over America right now. Ike has gone over my head and let de Gaulle grab control in France over my distinct opposition. Who's commander-in-chief around here? Well, you are, Mr. President. But Eisenhower had given his word to de Gaulle. By what right? That was an act of rank insubordination. Don't you think Ike should be removed immediately? Well, Mr. President, Eisenhower informed me that he was acting only because of military necessity. I would suggest that you reprimand him severely, but that's all. That's all? A reprimand? Yes, sir. General Marshall, I am outraged. I am also a politician. Ike Eisenhower doesn't realize it, but he's become the GI's general and the most popular figure in the free world. I think you're right. I am recommending to Congress that he be given a fifth star and the title of General of the Army. I have a tough election coming up. Michael, will thou take Francis, here present, for thy lawful wedded wife, according to the right of our Holy Mother, the Church? I will. Francis, wilt thou take Michael, here present, for thy lawful husband, according to the right of our Holy Mother, the Church? I will. I, Michael. I, Michael. Take thee, Francis. Take thee, Francis. To my wedded wife. To my wedded wife. To have and to hold. To have and to hold. To sound very good. It gets worse. German tanks have made a slight penetration of our lines in Belgium. 20 miles from the German border. We're supposed to be penetrating their lines. For heaven's sake, don't muck up Mickey's wedding. And in hell. I have to call a meeting. Tedder, Bradley, and Patton. I've got the Nazis on the ropes. Get them all out now. I'd say, Bradley, the others are too busy at the front to come here. They don't have to come here. I'll go to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Ike, I've never seen such confusion. The Nazis are using U.S. equipment and uniforms. They got a hold of a bunch of Krauts, probably escaped from Brooklyn, speaking perfect English. Who speaks perfect English in Brooklyn? Well, you know what I mean. Well, they're, they're, they're cutting telephone lines and turning signs around, spooking whole divisions, shoving a bulge into our lines. Yes, that's what the newspaper chaps already started to call it, the Battle of the Bulge. Yeah, this is no penty ante game, Mike. And Hitler's thrown all of his panzer divisions into the pot. All of them. Brad? Well, I can't give you an exact picture. My communications are shattered. Whole units have been wiped out. They've driven a wedge between the 8th and 9th armies. Over a hundred thousand men are cut off from here, Arthur. Our well, flying conditions are simply impossible. Nothing can get off the ground in this weather. I feel bloody helpless. This is no time to feel helpless. It's time to attack. We've, we've got to stabilize our lines first. Sandif, Baston, maybe half a dozen other pockets with cut off units. They might not be able to hold out. Well, damn it, they'll have to hold out. Maybe we should have figured Hitler would uh, try an insane gamble like this. Maybe I should have figured. Now that he's done it, let's take advantage of it. Now, Hitler has opened the door for us to Germany. He's thrown his only reserves out in the open. Now, if we strike back, this could be the last big battle of the war. You're damn right, Ike. If you give me back the supplies and the gasoline you gave Montgomery and Third Army, we'll beat their Nazi tails off. Thank you, George. I can always depend on you for the calm, reasonable approach. Well, well. Brad, you've got to hit with whatever you've got left but your 8th and 9th armies must go to Montgomery. Well, I'll never get them back, Ike. Dead or alive. Knock it off. This is an Allied operation. Mm. Now, Arthur, somehow, someway, you've got to get planes up in this soup. Now, the key to it all is right here in Bastogne. It controls all the major roads in central Belgium. You must hold on to this at all costs. The 101st Airborne is trying to hold it, but, you know, Ike, the Germans have got them completely surrounded. They can't hang on much longer. I know. That's where you come in, George. Ike Bastone is 130 miles from here. I mean, that's one hell of a long hike. You give me air support and, and I'll get through to him. No, he won't have anything in the air for at least 48 hours. It's too late. You're gonna have to do it without air support, George. You're gonna have to force march your men and send them into battle. Without food, maybe without sleep. Now, will they do it for you? Yeah, Third Army will do it. They hate my guts, but they'll do it. They know I'm a son of a bitch, but at least I'm their son of a bitch. <laughs> You're mine too, George. I know, Ike. This is the one I owe you. from Bastogne. German commander has informed General McCulloch that the 101st Airborne is completely surrounded and asked for his unconditional surrender. What did he say? General McCulloch told him, nuts, sir. Nuts? He actually told the German commander, nuts? Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
That officer has to be saved. I'm going to have him write all my speeches from now on. All right, move out. Christmas present he doesn't expect me. Is the weather all right to fly to his headquarters? To Hassel, Belgium? <laughs> not a chance. Everything's still grounded. And get that fancy private train ready. I'm not staying here one more minute. Now, Ike, you can't leave here day or night. Because of some stupid rumor that crowds are trying to assassinate me? Well, to hell with that. Molly is the only person trying to slit my throat. Come in. Ike, radio message just came in for you from 101st headquarters in Baston. It's, uh, it says, just Merry Christmas, and it's signed, Crybaby. <sighs> Patton's made it. Whoever would have thought blood and guts would turn out to be a Santa Claus. Now, what about Marty, Ike? Should we forget it? Well, hell no, he'll take credit for this, too. Just find out about that train. Ike, you know you're not supposed to leave this hotel. You've been seeing too many Hollywood movies. Ike, will you keep away from those windows? You know there could be sharpshooters out there. Can I go to the bathroom? Use your own judgment. I am. I'm going to Belgium to have it out with Monty once and for all. I, I don't care if the Germans send Frankenstein himself to knock me off. Now find out about that train. Yes, General. <sighs> Kay, let's get a breath of fresh air. I've been cooped up in here for two days because of these rumors. I please don't go outside. It really is too dangerous. Don't you want your present? Good to smell fresh air. Well, we're gonna smash him this time, Kay. I'm gonna let Molly muck it up. But at least you've learned one British word. I'll give you my diamond tiara so we can get back inside quickly. Not diamonds for you, Kay, not ever. Not in your character. Well, I think they're in my character. It's yours they're not in. I heard from Roosevelt last week. I'm getting my fifth star. Fifth uh, star? Yes. Oh, wonderful. Like Wellington. Like Marshall. Well, if you want to be provincial about it. Certainly, ended. So are you. Oh, what are they? The only ones in the world. Kay, you no longer to drive my car. You no longer to type my letters badly. You are now officially Lieutenant Summersby, Major General of the Army Eisenhower, entitled to wear his five stars yourself. The first woman in history to be a five-star aide, if history interests you. Merry Christmas, Kay. <laughs> they're not diamonds, but they'll do. That must certainly beautifully do. I only wish to God. I know. I know. Show your ID, sir. You know very well who I am. If you don't, you should be court-martialed. I suppose this is a show put on for me by Ike. Sir, I must have identification. 
matter, show me your papers, General. The Americans were afraid the Germans are trying to assassinate Ike. The Germans would never do that. They still want to win. Hello, Monty. Come right in. Step into my parlor. Take it anywhere you like. It's to be open battle. I prefer no witnesses. Do you agree, General? I'm not going to say anything in front of these officers they shouldn't hear. Well, I might. You'll excuse us, General Smith. Would you wait outside, Beetle? Right, General. After you, General. Getting odds, old boy? Abilene, by 40 points. <laughs> the German attack has run out of gas. That's not just a metaphor, it's a, it's a fact. Battle of the Bulge is over. Now, what we now need is some unity so we can finish this damn war. I couldn't agree more. Give me complete command, you can have both. Unity and victory. I don't see the need for a change. The same command that took us this far can take us all away. <laughs> You mean the same American generals who were surprised and outmaneuvered in this battle? <coughs> I'll be brutally frank. General Bradley should be removed immediately. I'll be brutally frank. He won't be. That's foolish. You need a commander of proven abilities to run the advance into Germany for you. I don't need anybody to lead any advance for me. That's supposed to be my job. Yes, it was, wasn't it? Now, you have me rather a botch of it, haven't you? Confusion, delay, division. Marty, this is not solving anything. Now, what I need to win this war is for us to work together. What you need is a single massive swift assault across the German border, which I will be happy to lead. Your assault is so swift. No one's been able to see it for these past few days. You haven't moved one inch toward the border. When I'm ready, I will move. No. You'll move when I'm ready, and I'm ready now. Now, if you don't want to do it, or if you think I'm wrong, then by God, there isn't room enough for both of us in this command. For once, you may be right. I've drafted a cable to the combined chiefs. This tug of war must end. Either they fire you, or they fire me. Does the Prime Minister know about this? Going over his head to recommend well, removal of a British commander? If he doesn't, I'll be glad to tell him. Don't bother. I'll do it. Next time we meet, please, don't smoke. Bonnie, for an intelligent man, you're pretty damn stupid. You never attack unless you have overwhelming forces. And I always attack when I know the other fellow is bluffing. You better take another look at your cards. Well, I know exactly what he meant. You don't think for one minute that Churchill's going to bite the hand that feeds England, do you? The United States is pouring twice as many men and machines and ten times as much money into this war as poor old Britain could afford. Churchill must do whatever Roosevelt tells him. And Roosevelt will do whatever Marshall says. Frankly, Monty, you're batting on a sticky wicket. Nonsense. Britain must have its best military brains in command. Who would they ever get to replace me? Field Marshal Brooke or General Alexander? I've put my foot in it, haven't I, Freddy? What the devil shall I do? Might I make a small suggestion? My dear Ike, you will hear no more from me on the subject of command. All of us up here will weigh in 100% to do what you want. Your devoted and loyal subordinate, Monte. Knifed across the German border. American forces capturing intact the Ludendorff Bridge across the Rhine at Remagen. General Eisenhower instantly ordered the breakthrough to be exploited at all costs. Our tanks are across the Rhine, fanning out into the Nazi heartland. Cologne and Frankfurt have fallen, and Russian troops have taken Vienna. The guns of doom are sounding for the Third Reich.
It's been a long, long time since an Eisenhower returned to Germany. Simply no way to describe what I have just seen. Around us pressed an evil smelling mob of men and boys who reached out to touch us. Generals and newsmen alike. They were dressed in rags and the remnants of uniforms. They were too weak to cheer. But even those who would soon be liberated by death were smiling at us with their eyes. We proceeded on to a yard where bodies were arranged in rows, sometimes in rags, sometimes naked. They were thin and very white. It appeared that most of the men and boys had died of starvation. Over in the green fields beyond, well-fed Germans were calmly plowing their fields for the spring planting. We looked then at the butcher hooks on which inmates were hung as punishment for being alive. If your stomachs have been turned by this rather mild description, it's all right. It's time for the world to know the truth about the Nazis. In two hours, I want every German in this town, starting with the Burgermeister, to march to this camp. No one is to turn his face. And everyone has said they didn't know. It made me ashamed my name is Eisenhower. Lieutenant, what are you doing here? Um... I, uh... I was, I was listening... to the BBC and, uh... President Roosevelt died last night. At Warm Springs in Georgia. Fair, is it? If I'd have done a better job, the Nazis would have surrendered in time for him to see it. But at least he didn't have to see this. He used to call me child. I never told him, but I always thought of him as father. I know what you mean. Final blows have come from the air. Gigantic daylight Allied bombing raids, turning the railroads and factories of Germany into smoking rubble. Russians 
has smashed into Berlin itself. Erwin Rommel has taken poison. Hitler has blown his brains out in his bunker in Berlin. Admiral Donitz has taken over the German government and sent General Alfred Jodl to negotiate a surrender with General Eisenhower. General Jodl says German communications are in bad shape and he requests a two-day delay before signing the surrender. Why? Well, they're stalling, so they can shift more of their troops to the west and surrender to us instead of the Russians. Nazis are scared to death of them. Well, they should be. They've murdered millions of Russian civilians. But if we allow the Nazis to dictate where and how they'll surrender, they'll never admit they were completely beaten. No deal. What do you want me to tell General Yodel? You tell Yodel that unless he surrenders immediately, I'm closing the Western Front to German soldiers. And they'll all have to surrender to the tender mercies of Marshal Zhukov and the Red Army. If Yodel agrees to sign immediately, will you be present? No. Not until after he's signed. Then bring him to my office. I don't intend to speak to one Nazi officer until they admit total defeat on German soil. I want to say a word. Mit dieser Unterschrift Mit dieser Unterschrift With this signature werden das deutsche Volk und die deutschen Streitkräfte the German people and the German armed forces auf Gedeih und Verderb dem Sieger ausgeliefert. Ah, for better or for worse, delivered into the victor's hands. In diesem Krieg, der mehr als fünf Jahre gedauert hat, in this war, which has lasted more than five years, haben beide wohl mehr geleistet und erlitten als irgendein anderes Volk in der Welt. Both have achieved and suffered more than perhaps any other people in the world. In dieser Stunde kann ich nur der Hoffnung Ausdruck geben, dass die Sieger sie mit Großmut behandeln. In this hour, I can only express the hope that the victor will treat them with generosity. God, first. <laughs> Come on. Sit in here and look fierce. Remember your proud Scots heritage. General Eisenhower, this is General Suslopichov and his Russian interpreters. terms of the document of surrender you just signed. Verstehen Sie die Bedingungen der Kapitulation zur Kunta, die Sie soeben unterzeichnet haben? Ja, ja. 
you will be held officially and personally responsible. Sie werden offiziell und persönlich verantwortlich gehalten werden. If the terms of this surrender are violated. Sofern die Bedingungen dieser Kapitulation verletzt werden. Including its provisions, einschließlich der Verfügungen, that German commanders appear in Berlin at the moment set by the Russian High Command to accomplish formal surrender to that government. Dass deutsche Kommandeure sich in Berlin zu dem Zeitpunkt zu stellen haben, der von russischen Oberkommando festgesetzt wird. That is all. Das ist alles. Signing the surrender. You want to hold these up for the camera, please? How about like this? Just a minute. Okay, I want you in. Come on, we started this thing together. We're finishing the same way. Okay, now. Mike, would you uh, would like to make a victory speech to the press? I'm not much in the mood for that now, but uh, I'll try. A few minutes ago in this building, Germany surrendered unconditionally its forces on land, sea, in the air. Germany has been thoroughly whipped. Is that all? Well, that gentleman is plenty. <laughs> General Dwight D. Eisenhower to be granted the freedom of London. This, this great city that never failed for a moment in the long monotonous days and in the long nights dark that fell. These are the shoulders upon which fell some of the most awesome decisions of this terrible war's most crucial moments. I feel we should give the most cordial testimony in our heartfelt good wishes for everything that may happen to him in the future. City, I present you this sword, 
symbolizing our gratitude and admiration. General Eisenhower, you are now a citizen of London. must always be the portion of any man who receives a claim earned in blood of his followers and sacrifice of his friends. This feeling of humility cannot erase, of course, my great pride in being tendered the freedom of London. Your lips are moving. Oh, we rehearsed for hours. If he's going to become part British, I don't want him to miss a single word. We had been more than two years in war when Americans in numbers began swarming into your country. Most believed that the tales of British sacrifice had been exaggerated. All such complacencies could not endure a single casual tour through your scarred streets and avenues. We saw your women serving quietly and efficiently in almost every kind of war effort, even with flak batteries. Gradually, we grew closer together until we became true partners in war. My most cherished hope is that after Japan joins the Nazis in utter defeat, neither my country nor yours need ever again summon its sons and daughters from their peaceful pursuits to face the tragedies of battle. But a fact important for both of us to remember, Neither London nor Abilene, sisters under the skin, will sell her birthright for physical safety, her liberty for mere existence. Mansion House in 30 minutes for the luncheon the Lord Mayor's giving you. Well, now that I'm a Londoner, I suppose it'll be uh, fish and chips. <laughs> well, you could do worse. Hamburger, for instance. Excuse me. Sorry. Sorry, my slave driver says I have to run. Uh, bye, gentlemen. Uh, bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Admiral, I promise you. An honor. Now remember, tomorrow you go back to Frankfurt, to occupation headquarters for a day, and then it's off to Paris, where they will probably give you the Champs Elysees for your keychain, and then you fly to Washington. Alone? Yes. Yes. I've always known, but every once in a while I very secretly let myself pretend. Oh dear, I'm, I'm, I'm a damn good soldier, but I'm not quite that good. Okay, I don't know what to say. And even if I did, it wouldn't be enough. Well, why don't you just say it? That you're sorry. That might be enough. I am sorry, Kate, you know that. Yes, I, I do know. And, and it helps, really, really. Oh, dear, this, I'm not doing this right at all. I did so want it to come out right. Yes, I did rehearse it a thousand times. Somehow, suddenly, it's here. Still, I, I don't suppose anyone ever actually 
suffocated under a rug, even a, a very thick historical one. I don't understand. Oh, well, no, no. It, uh, something... Someone said to me once when, uh, did, uh, nothing. Do you have a cigarette? Yes, of course, yes. <clears throat> Okay, uh, if only I could. Uh... Oh, poor darling, Ike. You don't owe me any special goodbyes. Thank you, Kay. Thank you, General. Now, no, we'd better go. There is so much more cheering to come.
just up to Mrs. Eisenhower. They tell me there are 30,000 people outside the airport waiting to see your husband. I've waited, too. Welcome home, Eisenhower. Well, listen to that mob. He could probably be elected guard this very minute. Hey, General Marshall, I don't want to be elected anything. I'm a soldier, not a politician. Listen, General, you have no right to refuse your country anything. Your life is no longer your own, remember that. I've had to fight the politicians off with sticks this past week. You can have any office you want. Only, there is one question nobody's able to answer. What the hell are you, Eisenhower? A Republican or a Democrat? I'm an American. 